Cool. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for joining us here. Lovely little Saturday, being quite an interesting week in the markets. There's lots going on in the oil market and then lots going on in the general market. And I think um, it's just, just some volatile times here ahead. Um, just a couple of rules, I guess. The video and the visuals are on Zoom. The audio uh, is on Twitter Spaces as well. I will only be taking questions on the Zoom just because the audio screws up otherwise on the spaces. Um, I'm not an investment advisor, so I definitely want to say that this is a volatile industry. Oil and gas is a, a very volatile kind of equities. They're price takers. They rely on what the, the underlying is trading at. So please do your own due diligence. Um, I want to stress this again because I got another message the other day saying that somebody just copied my portfolio exactly off the website. So um, I definitely don't want to hear that. But uh, if you do your own due diligence and that's what you come up with, um, all the power to you. So um, yeah, so I definitely want to stress that, that I'm not an advisor. Everything here is my opinion. I'm sharing the research that I do and what I see, the data, the trending on the macro side and then how I value these companies. Um, so we'll be going through Whitecap, Pato, and Spartan Delta today. Yeah, so I think we'll we'll get started. We we do a little macro outlook. I will caveat this by telling everyone it's it's about a two hour macro outlook. I make sure I kind of want to go through everything because if I don't, I get a bunch of questions. And I believe if you're investing in oil and gas, you really need need to know all the countries, what's going on, inventory, supply, demand. And if you have a good kind of understanding of that, and, and hopefully I can get that across, um, you, you still sleep well at night, even when the oil price drops four bucks or you have these black swan kind of events like, like we had on Thanksgiving. So I think it's, um, you know, it's pretty important, in my opinion, to, to have a good understanding of, of the whole dynamic of the industry. And you know, I, I can barely get, get a scratch on it because the industry is so huge and there's so much going on, but I think, um, you know, my hope is to get, get, get as much out as I can. So yeah, so we'll get started. Once again, anyone on Twitter that wants to join the, the visuals, um, the link is on the website, whitetundra.ca. Scroll to the bottom, you'll see the Zoom link and um, you can join in. Feel free to interrupt me anytime here on the Zoom if you have some questions or put it in the chat. I'll have the chat open. And this video will also be recorded and hope to have it posted by tonight on the, um, on the YouTube and on the, on, on the website. So we'll get started. Um, so like I said, we'll get started a little bit on the pricing end of things. How are the pricing looking? Um, inventories, demand, supply, the three things that matter. If you can understand these things and you can follow the trends, you kind of have an, have an idea of, of what's happening today and what's going to happen over the next few weeks, few months, whatever your investment time frame is. And then we'll do the company valuations. So for anyone that's joined me for the previous sessions, it's it's pretty much the exact same. I got a couple of requests for white cap, given that the results are coming out this Thursday, uh, Thursday or Wednesday. So I put that on there. Pedo is a gas name. Um, I did Pine Cliff two weeks ago and people were wanting to compare it with another gas play. So I, so I threw Pedo in there. And then uh, Spartan Delta, which is a name that I recently got into and I've got a lot of questions about and people have been reaching out to me. I, I posted a little thread on Twitter why I believe their well results are, are gonna um, you know, hit it out of the park, which they did based on their, their recent result uh, update here last week. So I'm, I'm happy to share some, some of the latest well results on that some of the latest info I have. And um, everyone knows I love the, the Monty Condense players with, with ARC resources as well. So, um, so yeah, so look forward to that. So we'll start on the pricing. We have WTI looking, looking really strong above $90 uh, US, which we have not been able to say that for more than eight, eight years or so now. Um, and you know, it almost feels surreal. We were sitting here and we, we see oil drop from 94 to 92 and we're kind of uh, panicking a bit, but you know, we're, we're at $92 oil. Like this is, this is, we, we have not been able to say this for a long time. I started investing in 2013, late 2013, and I got maybe three or four or five months of, of, of 90 plus oil. 
before everything collapsed. So, you know, looking very good. And if you if you look at this line here over the last couple of years, we have seen these big drawdowns that occur for months at a time. So we had some in late 2020, we had the Delta variant issue in the summer of 21. We had the Thanksgiving drawdown in late um, 2021. So it's just something we have to get used to as, as oil investors that this can happen and position your portfolio accordingly to kind of not, not get whacked out of the game with, with these drawdowns. I guess what we have seen, the one thing is that equities are very strong. It used to be that when the oil price fell 10, $15, the equities would fall 30, 40%. And it's no longer the case. They're, they're holding in very strong. We have a lot of share buybacks going on. So they do support the price up to an extent and help out. Um, we we'll look at gas pricing. We're about four and a half dollars US for Henry Hub. Again, pretty much the high end of the last 10 years of, of pricing. Um, natural gas producers are finally getting some relief. We've had the, the industry has been depressed because of a lot of associated gas coming out from the Permian and the Bakken and the Eagleford uh, screwing up some of the supply demand dynamics. But with LNG online in, in the US, um, things are looking good finally after, after a while. And um, yeah, so both oil and gas are, are kind of looking good here. Uh, moving on to Canadian pricing, we have the condensate, Canadian condensate chart, which I call C5+, plus, which is the light oil that comes out of the Monty area. Um, amazing. It's trading above WTI pricing still. We're at about $92.5 a barrel uh, US. So looking very, very good from that standpoint. Again, it's, it's kind of like an eight-year eight high uh, is where we're at. We have WCS pricing, which is the Canadian heavy oil uh, benchmark, Western Canadian Select. Looking absolutely incredible. $78 a barrel for WCS. I mean, you know, people would have said you're you're uh, making a fool of them if, if you told them that was what the price was going to be, you know, a year ago or, or 18 months ago, or even two or three years ago, pre-COVID. It was uh, unthinkable to have this sort of pricing. So... If we take that WCS price and we put it on a 10 year chart, which is this top chart here, um, we're not quite where the 2010 to 2014 period was. We're at about, so this chart is old. We're at, we're at $78 right about here, um, as I showed in the last, last slide here. So we're kind of at the 2013 period, but, but not quite so far at the 2014 highs, the 2012 highs. But let's look at the US dollar to Canadian chart. When you look at WCS pricing in Canadian dollars, $80 Canadian is roughly about $100 US right now because the, the exchange rate is about 1.275. So if we go back to the 2010 to 2014 period, even though WCS was at 85, 90 US, the exchange rate used to be on par or about 1.05, 1.1. So our pricing we're getting today for Western Canadian Select heavy oil, which makes up the majority of Canadian production, producers like Synovus, CNRL, Suncor, Meg, et cetera, are getting about 2010 to 2014 pricing already. So that's a really good sign for us. In a Canadian dollar term, the Canadian producers are doing a lot better. Um, they're doing as good as they were back in 2010, 2014. Their operating costs are lower. They're doing a lot of... Uh, less capital expenditures. So the future is very, very bright for Canadian producers from a cash flow perspective and for investors from an investment perspective. Um, lo looking at Canadian gas, absolutely incredible. This used to trade in the negatives in the summer. In the winter months, you could get $2 a gigajoule, maybe two and a half on, on the good days. Now we've got an eco strip, more than $4 a gigajoule for the next 12 months. So very, very strong pricing. Um, we look here from the last month, even the pricing has increased substantially despite what people would call a relatively war warm winter in Canada and the US. So, you know, the supply demand dynamics are finally in our favor a bit. There's a lot of intra Alberta demand that's come online due to coal to gas switching. 
there's a lot of more people in Alberta and BC and Saskatchewan and in general. Um, the oil sands producers are ramping up a bit. They're a big user of gas. And LNG Canada is, is getting closer and closer to, to um, starting up in 2025, notwithstanding the, the latest attack we had. So um, hopefully everything goes well with, with that. And hopefully everyone's doing well. Um, the European gas, you know, this was one of the big things. Europe, Europe is a big import gas market. All throughout 2021, we were roughly at 15 to $20. Um, I don't know what the units are on this. I, I think it's per megawatt hour. Um, we're now at 50. This is the 2023 strip. So looking even more than a year out, the European gas is looking very strong, which makes, which is an e extra bonus for us producers because if European gas is strong, the LNG market will be strong, which pushes Henry Hub pricing up and that pushes ACO pricing up and it pushes the entire worldwide gas stream is looking very strong as long as we're in this dynamic. Asia is, is very hungry for, for natural gas as well. The Middle East is very hungry for it. So, you know, all around the pricing is just looking fantastic. But the question comes, is it gonna stay? So that's what we'll discuss here. Um, we'll go into the, we'll start with inventories. Um, I think inventories are, are very important. There's people who have, who have stopped looking at inventories because they think, oh, it's just a bunch of oil sitting around. So if we have five years of supply, you know, what does it really matter? It matters because it tells you what the current supply di uh, demand dynamic is. If the inventories are dropping, that tells you we're in a supply shortfall and a supply deficit. So if we look at global oil inventories, we'll start with that. We, we went down about a million barrels a day. Throughout 2021, if we go from around the March, April timeframe, we're down about a million barrels a day in terms of the supply demand deficit. And that is a consistent million barrels a day throughout the year, despite America adding production, Canada adding production, um, OPEC plus adding 400,000 barrels a day. We've got production from all across the world coming online, stuff that was shut in in 2020 and uh, people bringing, bringing new wells online. But the global oil inventory curve didn't change. We were down a million barrels consistent. And when we look at crude oil and products, so we'll add, we'll add the two, we're at 2 million barrels a day of supply shortfall. So crude oil is in a 1 million barrel a day shortfall and the products as in gasoline, distillates, jet fuel, et cetera, are in a 1 million barrel a day shortfall. So the total world supply shortfall of the oil market is about 2 million barrels a day. And in the first kind of six weeks of 2022, it's about the same. We see about 1.5 to 2 million barrels a day of shortfall, even with the big impact of, of the Omicron variant, which, which subdued demand a bit. People weren't going to the workplace anymore. Um, you know, people had a lot of positive tests, like the Calgary positivity rate was like at 40% when I checked. So, you know, a lot of people were staying home, but um, you know, we're, we're back on our trend going downwards. So, so we're back in that kind of 1.5 to 2 million barrel a day shortfall. Again, OPEC's added more production this year so far. American shale is, is adding production, Canada's adding production, but the supply demand deficit remains. And this is one of the biggest factors that I look at. When somebody asks me why I'm not selling, you know, crude oil is at 90 bucks, why am I not selling? Well, nothing has changed on the supply demand dynamic. So why would you sell when the industry remains in such a, a considerable shortfall? Looking at the US specifically, we have the EIA uh, total liquid stockpile. So that's all the crude, all the products they have, everything combined. Um, it used to be flat, you know, January to March is kind of a low demand season. And we look at the last five years, we're kind of flat for the first three months of the year until this year where we've just fallen right off a cliff. Um, you know, about five to 10 million barrels a day of inventory um, drawdowns every week for those following the EIA weekly reports. Um, you, you know, you, you know this already, you've been following this. Um, so 
a counter seasonal drawdown. And look where we are. We're, we're already at the 2010 to 2014 average in inventories. So, you know, forget the last five years. We're at an inventory levels when oil used to trade above 90 bucks a barrel consistently all the way up to 110, $120 a barrel. We're already at those inventory levels. And if we take this chart on the left and we put it in a consecutive kind of time frame, look at the drawdown that we've had. And we're at about 1750 now, so 1.75 billion barrels. So take this, this line, extend it a little bit further because it's an older graph. And you know, look at the slope of this line. As an investor, th this makes me very happy. As long as this slope continues, we've never had a slope like this ever in, in the last, you know, this chart is a 17 year chart, a sustained line inventory drawdown like this, and it shows no sign of stopping. So for anyone that's suddenly telling you that inventories are gonna start building all of a sudden in Q1 has been completely wrong so far. And, you know, that's putting it politely. They, they were forecasting builds, we've had continued draws and the slope has not changed. As long as the slope doesn't change, why would I sell? Because whenever the slope goes down, crude price goes up. Whenever the inventory is built, usually crude price is, is a little bit depressed and starts going down. Um, looking at crude specifically in the US crude oil, we see kind of the same trend. We've dropped below a billion barrels um, you know, for the first time in, in forever. We see we're below the 2010 to 2014 average by a consistent margin here. So if you wanna look at crude specifically, we're sitting on very low inventories in the US. Now, add in the fact that since 2014, which is kind of where we're comparing our inventory numbers to, there's been about 50 million barrels of line fill added. So what does that mean? All the active pipelines in the US need oil in them because if you're gonna transport oil, the pipeline has to be full. So over the last seven or eight years, we've added about 50 million barrels of pipeline capacity. Why is that important? It's important because this oil is not really usable inventory. It's inventory that's required to keep the entire system going. And the more of such inventory you add, the less actual inventory you have, the, the usable inventory, which you can pull from right away. Because you can't just go, go out there and empty pipelines and say, oh yeah, this is our inventory because your whole system would collapse at that point. So if we go back to this crude storage graph and we take another 50 million barrels out, um, and look at only usable inventory, you know, I think this graph paints a perfect picture. We are well below our 2010 to 2014 crude oil average and the world and even Americans are just not realizing this, how far below the 2010 to 2014 average we are already, about 10%, 10 to 12% below it. And no one cares. It, it seems like the world just continues on so when people in the Middle East are telling you that we're sleepwalking into this oil crisis, these are the charts they're looking at. These are the charts they're analyzing and looking at what, what's the actual usable oil left. And, uh, you know, the, the picture speaks a thousand words, as they say. Um, we look at the SPR directly, which is the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The U.S. has one of the biggest in the world. And... Um, it's to be used in times of hurricanes, earthquakes, um, world wars, uh, you know, those kinds of scenarios. But the American administration has decided that it can be used as a political tool to lower gas prices. So they've been pulling from this strategic petroleum reserve, even though there's no real reason to. Um, and it just keeps going down. This, this emergency oil is being drawn into. And, you know, we're down about 18, 20% in, in these stockpiles over the last, not even a year. So what does that tell you? If the biggest consumer of oil in the world has drawn down their emergency stockpiles by about 18, 20%, um, 15 to 18%, let's say. And 
continually going down and the oil price still continues to go up, inventory still continue to, to draw down, right? You, you add one plus one and it kind of, uh, you, can, you can see that in these graphs. So where are we in the SPR? We're at 20 year lows. This is the, the uh, SPR inventory graph for the last 22 years. We're at levels that we last saw in 2003. So our emergency kind of stockpile is running low. And based on what the administration has told us for this year, we might be drawing down by the end of this year to levels last seen in 1985. You know, a lot of the people on this call weren't even born in 1985. So, you know, we're, we're taking this emergency oil that we have to subsidize our current supply demand deficit. How long can this last? You can't just pull on these tanks forever. And worldwide, we're seeing this pull on these emergency stockpiles. And again, the world is blind. They, they don't seem to care. They think uh, oil is on its way out. It's going to zero dollars in the next couple of years. Um, electric vehicles will take over, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the data tells you a different story. And I think for us who are invested already, we've been kind of following this sort of data. US product inventories, so gasoline plus distillate plus jet fuel, um, we, we see the same thing. We're drawing down about a month before we usually do. So there's this build season, um, January to March, and then we have a drawdown um, after that. But this year we see, we've started drawing down the big three as they call it, gasoline plus distillate plus jet fuel. We've started, started drawing down in kind of late January. Um, and we're already below the five-year average, well below the five-year average. So, you know, it's not just crude oil, it's also products that are showing you the same story. You know, some people were commenting that, hey, crude oil is going down, but that's because refineries are, are running hard and there's a bunch of gasoline and whatnot, and it's all false. It's, it's, you know, they never seem to be able to back it up with any data. And the data here shows you that that's not the case. It's crude and products that are both below their uh, fiber averages and, and drawing down further. Gasoline, um, you know, in the five-year range, but again, drawing down about a month or two earlier than usually does. Distillates are well below our five-year average. Uh, distillates meaning diesel and some of the heavier, heavier blends. Um, and, you know, again, just drawing down well below um, the average and drawing down before we usually start drawing down. Um, jet fuel, I don't have an updated graph. We're at about 37 million right now. So we did build slightly, but, um, you know, still below the five-year average on jet fuel. And some might say that jet fuel um, usage hasn't even really begun yet. So what does that tell you? If, if jet fuel usage hasn't even really begun and you're already sitting below five-year averages? Not, not really a good look for, from a insurance or a safety net kind of scenario, right? If you were running a business, um, that's not the situation you wanna be in. So propane, same story. America has started exporting a bunch of propane um, recently with their gas production rising. There was another pipeline that came online last week that's gonna add another 300,000 barrels of, of export capacity. And the world is hungry for American propane. They want these um, uh, propanes to, to use outside of America. So there's gonna be more export capacity keep getting built. And the inventories in the US, again, below the five-year average. I, I don't know how often I can keep saying that. It's well below the five-year average. And again, it's drawing down at a time when we're supposed to build. It's the same story across every single petroleum product um, and crude oil. Moving on to Canadian inventories, we, we built a lot in November, December. We had the Trans Mountain outage. Um, so a lot of oil got stuck within Hardesty, within Alberta. And now we're kind of below 25 million barrels. 
we're at a point we haven't seen in terms of oil inventories in many, many years. And we're getting close to our operational range, our lowest operational range. So when I was talking about the line fail and that you can't just pull every barrel out of every tank that's out there, this is what this graph shows you. What, what's the minimum amount required just to keep the system running? And we're getting pretty, pretty close to that already um, at a time that Canadian production just hit its all time high. So production is at an all time high and inventories keep dropping. This is why looking at inventories is so important because it paints a picture. It tells you the story of demand. Where, where is demand? Um, you know, because if you look at the supply is at its highest point and inventories are dropping, that tells you demand is maybe even higher than, uh, than, than people are, are forecasting. And there's a comment here that, that this slide is important for differentials, absolutely bang on. When you look at the WCS differential, it's usually lower as in you get a better pricing for WCS when the inventories are lower. So um, uh, thanks for making that point. Saudi inventories, they built from 2004, five, they almost doubled their inventory till 2015. And then in the last five years, it's come crashing down to the lowest level ever recorded. Um, you know, so again, when people tell you that that Saudi can pump so much oil and you know, blah blah blah, no, they're they're actually pulling a lot of it or a portion of it from the inventories as well. So it's not strictly production that they're sending out. It's also inventories. Again, the second biggest you know second biggest producer in the world, their inventories are sitting at at twenty year lows. America's inventories are sitting at twenty year lows. Across the world, it's the same story. It's not just America. Um, this is Fujairah, which is a port, I believe, in, in the UAE, um, United Arab Emirates. Um, very, very low inventories. And the latest report we got was 14.26 uh, million. Um, this graph is not updated, but the, the text here is. The, so I'll just read it out. The lowest level since stock reporting began at the start of 2017, total stocks fell 5.6 million barrels or down 28% week over week, the largest single fall in stocks since reporting began. So again, you know, people come up with these th theories that if American inventories are low, well, maybe the world inventories are high, not the case. I just showed you Canada, Saudi, and UAE. Um, Fujera inventories, again, the lowest since reporting began. What does that tell you? This is Chinese inventories. So when, when the coronavirus first hit, China built up this huge stock of extra inventory um, within their refineries, within their storage tanks. And they kind of began drawing these down. The two biggest refiners, which I believe are Sinopec and PetroChina, are basically out of extra inventory. And there's a, there's a lot of um, refiners and petrochemical plants that are in the negative. So they have, their inventories now are, are below pre-COVID levels. Let's put it that way. This is an older graph. It's about three months old. So, you know, this line is, is same or on a smaller slope. They're still drawing down inventories. Um, you know, that's a fact. I, I wish I had an updated graph on this, but it's very hard to get accurate data from, from Chinese inventories. Um, it's not as transparent as, as the US is. Floating inventories. So apart from inventories on land, there's, there's all this inventory sh um, sitting on ships on the sea. And what do we see again, from about October till mid January, we drew down about 30% of our floating inventories, most of it in China. They pulled all these ships in, they stopped importing for a little bit and, and they pulled a bunch of ships with, with oil um, for, for use within the country. But, you know, sitting again at pre-COVID levels, th there's no huge build anywhere across the globe where 
you know, there's this random stock of inventory sitting somewhere that we, we can't see for some reason. So from an inventory standpoint, looking very good. Jet fuel inventories in, in US, Japan and ARA, which is um, Amsterdam, I believe, um, sitting at multi-year lows. Again, this graph goes all the way to 2016-ish. We're sitting below that and jet fuel has not even returned. Jet fuel demand is still lower, which I'll talk later here in, this, uh, in these slides. Um, inventories in Vietnam, I don't have an actual slide um, showing the actual inventories in Vietnam, but the oil is trading at, at a huge premium. So what does that tell you? If, you're, if your product is trading at a huge premium to the dated uh, benchmark pricing, that tells you that there's a big demand for it and therefore that the inventories are probably running low, just as we've seen across the world. So where does it go from here? This is the same kind of graph we saw earlier. Worldwide oil demand or uh, oil inventories are dropping about a million barrels a day. The EIA and the IEA, two US bodies that claim to have the latest and greatest data forecasting, they were wrong in January 2021 by a significant margin. The December 2021 outlook was wrong. And the January 2022 outlook is just an embarrassment how wrong it is. Um, they were forecasting inventory builds. Instead, we saw a draw in January of 34 million barrels difference than what they were forecasting. Um, so, you know, just an absolute uh, embarrassment, I guess, is the best word I can use for, for these forecasting. And, and anyone telling you that for some reason we've been drawing inventories and now suddenly we're going to start building at half a million barrels a day is just telling you wrong information. They've been consistently wrong the whole way down and nothing in the trending, nothing in the data would lead you to that sort of conclusion. Um, and if anyone can show me data that, that where these sort of forecasts are coming from, I'm happy to discuss and have a look at that. So that's on the inventory side. Are there any questions on the inventories from the, uh, the Zoom call? Anyone has any thoughts? If not, we'll move on to the demand portion. Cool. So we know what inventories are doing. They're dropping. Where is demand going? There's all this talk about demand destruction. Um, you know, if, if the oil price goes too high, you're going to have people stop, stop using petroleum products. Um, American oil demand, the four-week average, just hit an all-time high by a significant margin. At a time when the Omicron variant is still present in a lot of states, and a lot of states are still not fully open. So if you project that out, what does that tell you? As states are opening, they're dropping their mask mandates. They're dropping their, um, some of the requirements to enter certain areas. Um, you know, this is gonna keep going up and it's already at an all time high. Gasoline, I'll discuss here, but gasoline and jet fuel have still not recovered to pre COVID levels. Yet our US product supplied of petroleum products is at an all time high by significant margin. You know, what is that telling you? Is that telling you that demand is going down? I, I don't think so. And until I see any data showing as such, I don't think it, it makes sense to be scared of demand destruction because we haven't even seen demand stabilize yet, let alone go into a destruction phase um, that, ev that, that a lot of the, the bearish people are, are already getting concerned about. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, Weekly gasoline demand, as I'd kind of mentioned, we're, we're a little bit below pre-COVID um, gasoline demand. It's a soft season. This graph on the right tells you the, the US total vehicle miles driven by month. And you see February is the lowest month. Um, January is the second lowest month. And then we have this huge uptick in March. Um, you know, so I expect to see this US gasoline demand continue to ramp up now that we're kind of more than two thirds of the way through February, it will uh, continue to ramp up here. Um, and uh, you know, looking good into March, April, the demand goes up again. May, June, July, August are kind of the big demand seasons. And um, our friend Gas Buddy Guy, who, who does a lot of great work with this, with this 
kind of data. He posted some, some information on December, 2021. The US total vehicle miles driven in December, 2021 was higher than 2019 already. So, you know, if we're already beating 2019 kind of miles driven, what does that tell you going into the future? As people do more road trips, finally, a lot of these states are open. People can, can go to these camping spots um, with full, full opening, not at 50% or 25% capacity. Um, you know, like some places like Yellowstone and whatnot were last year. It's, it, it'll be fully open this time. So I expect gasoline demand to hit all time highs in the US this upcoming summer. And that's a statement I'll, I'll stand behind no matter if gas is at four bucks a gallon or four and a half bucks a gallon. I really don't think it matters. Um, jet fuel, let's get to flights, commercial flights across the world. We, are, we had this kind of inflection point is what I'll call it on the 4th or 5th of February. And it's one that us oil bulls had been watching for for a long time that when is this extra two, two to two and a half million barrels a day of jet fuel demand going to come online? We need to see a big uptick in, in global flights. I believe we've seen it on February 4th, we hit a low. And um, from February 4th to 11th, the number of flights worldwide went up 12% in a week. So we've hit the first inflection point. There's gonna be more coming here. And you know, somebody might be looking at this graph and say, well, hang on, we're already at 2019, almost at 2019 levels in terms of flights. So how can you keep saying that the jet fuel demand is 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 not up there? It's because we have we've had extra flights online going from LA to San Francisco, Boston to New York, um, Spain to France, etc. We we have extra flights online, but the big jet fuel usage flights going from New York to Paris and Paris to Indonesia and Indonesia to Melbourne, these 12, 14 hour flights are not online yet. So even though we only have about 20% of the number of flights to come online, we have about 40% of jet fuel demand from pre-COVID to come online. And, you know, looking very, very good because these, these long haul flights, once it gets started, um, they're gonna consume jet fuel, no matter if they have 50% full or 75% full or 100% full, they're going to consume a lot of jet fuel. Um, the highest jet fuel usage is when the plane is coasting. It's not during takeoff. It's not during landing. It's when the plane is coasting, which there's not really that much coasting time on a flight between LA to San Francisco or San Diego, whereas there is on these long haul international flights. Um, so keep an eye out for this, this uh, global flights. This is very important in terms of the global supply dip demand dynamic. Jet fuel can add a million barrels a day in a month if, if we really see a big ramp up in, in Europe and uh, Australia and Southeast Asia opening at the same time. You could see a million barrels a day in a month getting added. Um, you know, that's, that's very significant um, at a time people are talking about uh, demand destruction. Um, we look at China, China flight demand. They had this kind of low pre-Olympics. Now they're back up a little bit, you know, holding steady, still going on this upwards trajectory. And China is one place where the domestic flights really ramped up. We're, we're sitting well above the pre-2019 pre domestic flights, but the international flights um, have not fully returned. And that can be seen in this graph. The international traffic to China is less than a 10th of pre-pandemic levels, yet the number of flights is about only 20% below pre-pandemic levels. So again, to my point, when these international flights start coming back, that's when the big jet fuel inflection point happens. Um, so far in China, in the first couple of weeks of January, we didn't see this, but I think you, you will start to see this as we go into March, April, and, and into the summertime here. And, um, you know, again, I keep repeating the same thing, but it's the big jet fuel flights that are coming back with a vengeance. And they're using up a lot of fuel. They're eating up 
a lot of demand and uh, eating up a lot of the inventories that are sitting around. Um, flights in India, we had a, again, because of the Omicron variant, we had this drawdown. We're steadily growing now. Um, the government has basically said, look, this, this variant is gonna spread and it's hit its peak. So let's, let's get things going, let's, let's open up. We wanna cut down some of these requirements and you know, testing and, and um, tracking of people and whatnot. And this, this line is gonna continue going up as more people go there um, to meet their, meet their relatives they haven't seen in, in a long time and travel and tourism and whatnot. We look at Australia and Canada, pretty flat, but going up. This is kind of the, the minimum level of flights required to keep the country operating. So if that's the case, the risk for jet fuel demand is all to the upside. You really can't function a country, you know, below a minimum kind of level of flights going. Um, I'll throw this in here. Private jet usage is like through the roof. Uh, I don't have exact data, but people are using private jets at an alarming rate and then telling you to stop uh, contributing to climate change. So, um, you know, a lot of these flights are also private jets that have, that have come online here recently. Um, Japan dr dropping a little bit as the Omicron variant hits. We see Malaysia flat, but a big upside here as they get back to the pre-pandemic levels. Um, South Africa, this is a very interesting one with the, the whole planet spooked over South Africa in, in late November, their flights never dropped. Um, pretty interesting, especially because a bunch of countries banned flights from, from South Africa and yet the flights never dropped. Um, Indonesia, again, a big tourist destination where we see the upside risk um, and we're kind of sitting at the minimum level of flights required to run the country. It's all upside risk upside demand uh, risk. Uh, did I miss one here? Vietnam, so that's the first country in Southeast, A Southeast Asia that kind of opened up fully and you see how fast the flights have returned. From the beginning of the year, we have about more than doubled in less than six weeks. Um, Spain, the Omicron variant hit, we're back on our trajectory up. Germany, UK, the entire European area is like this, growing, steadily their jet fuel usage. Um, what's this one on the top? Uh, Mexico and Dominican Republic, we're, at, we're above pre-pandemic um, jet fuel usage already. The flights are already above what they were pre-pandemic. So people are already traveling to countries that are open. It's, it's, it's not like people are fully scared of traveling. These countries that have decided to open up are already getting a lot of traffic. Um, Colombia, we're about 20, 25% above pre-pandemic levels. So you, you can't just compare the jet fuel usage to what it was in early 2020 and late 2019. We have data that's showing consumption and jet fuel usage above 2019 levels already in a few countries that are fully open. So, you know, not only do we have upside risk, the two to two and a half million barrels a day I mentioned to get to pre-pandemic usage, we have another 500,000 to a million barrels if demand continues to rise as what we call the pent up demand scenario. People who, who haven't seen their grandparents in two years, people who haven't, who've uh, delayed their weddings, people who've delayed their bachelor parties, et cetera. If, if this pent up demand also comes online, um, there is an incredible amount of jet fuel usage that's gonna pop up in a very short period. Um, Turks and Caicos, I like to mention this. Um, you know, smaller destination, but we're sitting almost double what we were pre-pandemic. Um, so where are we going? Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines have opened up as of early February slash um, mid mid February. This is 80 million passengers a year of tourism that has been shut down since March of 2020. So there's 80 million passengers, which was the pre-pandemic kind of levels, going to these four countries that now have full free reign to go back. I've already heard of travel plans from my 
uh, friends and family who are going to Bali, who want to go to um, Cambodia and Vietnam and Malaysia and Singapore. Um, a lot of business travel will come back. So, you know, when I talk about the inflection point, not only the, does the data show it's here, the news releases and the anecdotal evidence also support uh, supports that thesis and uh, looking looking very good from uh, from a jet fuel standpoint going forward. Um, okay, so let's get off jet fuel then. Gasoline demand in India continual rise um, month over month, year over year, just keeps going up. We had this drawdown in early 2020. We proceeded to hit all time highs in late 2021. Then the Delta variant hit um, and we're back up now on our way towards continual growth. The crude throughput keeps going up as in the refinery runs keep going up. Um, India is planning to double their refining capacity in the next eight years. And any country that's trying to reduce their petroleum usage does not build refineries. These are 10, 15, 20, 25 year amortized projects. So they're expecting their demand to keep going up um, and they wanna double their refining capacity. So looking very good. Um, highway construction, India was building about 5,000 kilometers a year of highway between 2009 and 2014. That went up to 9,000 kilometers a year between 2014 and 2021. Um, 2021, their goal was 11,000. They built more than 13,000 kilometers of highway in one single year. Um, the Indian Highways and Transportation Minister wants to hit 35,000 kilometers of highway construction a year. Again, people don't just build highways for them to sit around and do nothing. This is for the upcoming gasoline usage diesel usage, um, a lot of LPGs used in, in India, um, uh, CNG, compressed natural gas vehicles. So, um, you know, anyone using pre-pandemic levels of growth in oil demand is going to be completely wrong, um, in my opinion, because they use some sort of linear curve when we see that where we are right now is in an exponential growth period in some of these emerging markets. And I'll share more data here um, as we go. There's a question here on what is the best equity exposure to jet fuel? I honestly don't know which equity would, would sell jet fuel directly. Um, if someone has any comments, please post them on the chat here, on the Zoom chat um, to help uh, it clear out. But I. I don't have an answer to that. I, I don't invest in jet fuel directly, although it could be an interesting place to be um, where we are right now. Um, utility vehicle sales in India, we saw about 30% growth year over year in 2016. We saw 20% in 2017. It kind of slowed down a bit after that. And 2021 to 2022 is going to be a record breaking year by a long shot. Um, in the first six months of the year, we've already hit about 80% of the high, um, of the previous high in terms of utility vehicle sales. So if, if you've hit 80% of the sales in six months, you're gonna absolutely clobber the old high uh, in vehicle sales. Um, India's fiscal year goes from April to April. That's why I'm referencing, uh, referencing six months of the year. Um, just for anyone confused about that. Um, more on India, the number of operational airports. So India doubled their airports from 50 to 100 in 18 years, from 2000 to 2018. In the next 12 years, they're going to two and a half times that again. So by 2030, they're projecting 250 airports. And what do airports bring? They bring people traveling, people doing road trips, people um, renting vehicles and going out all over the place, people going to Dubai, people going to Indonesia from India. So the demand, again, it, it's an exponential curve. It's not linear anymore. Um, we look at the internet penetration percentage in India. So how many people have access to internet? 
it's roughly tripled since 2014, from 18% to roughly 51%. Again, once people have access to the internet, what do they want? They want what the Western world has. They want TVs, they want motorcycles, they want barbecues, they want refrigerators, they want to drive, they want to travel. They look at nice pictures of Dubai, that's where they want to go. So as people get access to the internet, the more they want to be like the Western world, the developed world, you can call it, and the more their, their thirst for energy and petroleum grows. Lifetime luminosity in India in the last 10 years. So on the left, you know, they had these hotspots in the big, big areas. In just 10 years, the entire country has lit up with all this electricity usage, with people um, traveling, people using electricity in the evenings. Um, the, the infrastructure has grown substantially in just nine years and is expected to continue growing um, as the country modernizes, as people go from the poor classes to the middle class and they, they spend more money, they spend more energy. You know, that's the story we're, we're uh, at. Um, China oil demand, another big consumer, another big emerging market um, slash emerged market um, is importing more than 10 million barrels a day. So over 10% of the world's demand is now going to China in terms of imports, just imports, along with their own domestic uh, production that they're consuming. Um, they were pulling from their SPRs, they were pulling from their crude oil stocks. We had this big panic that China had stopped importing in October when the data showed you they, they, they stopped importing because they started pulling from their inventories. So again, this is why um, inventories is so important because it tells you the entire story that just imports or just demand or just supply doesn't show you. So, you know, now that China doesn't have as much inventory, they're back on the market, again, pulling um, uh, crude, crude imports from, from the rest of the market. Um, a lot from Russia and Saudi Arabia, um, Iraq, the Middle East, um, Iran as well, which I'll talk about here, um, under the table oil. So this is, uh, this is cool. So this was posted by, by tanker trackers, um, which shows you satellite data on, on Chinese crude inventories. On the left is I think a year ago where a lot of the tanks are full. We can tell because their lids are right at the top. These are floating tanks. So as the oil gets drawn down in the tanks, the lids go down, which you see in this picture on the right. There's tanks on the left side here that are kind of empty looking on the bottom that are looking you know, empty. Even these white tanks, which I assume are the main tanks that they're using are, some of them are looking um, less full. So, you know, the data is being supported by the satellite imagery, is being supported by the demand um, curve, the supply curve, et cetera. Um, I just wanna make a point here. Anyone on Twitter that's, that wants the visuals, please join the Zoom call. Um, the link is on whitetundra.ca. Scroll to the bottom there under events, there's a Zoom link. And um, we did get hijacked one time. So I'm just a little wary of adding people with names like test guest and iPad one and whatnot. So please uh, put a real name. Um, it doesn't have to be your real name, put like use use something like oil, oil something or whatever. Uh, but I'm I'm not gonna be adding people with, with, with names like test guest and um, iPhone one and such uh, just for the sake of safety. Um, Chinese electricity consumption straight up, even in 2020 and 2021, it didn't really stop growing. The slope of the line changed a little bit, but still continues to go up. Um, primary energy consumption, again, China keeps going up. The US and Europe are flat, but they keep using more petroleum products. Um, and then India and Africa, you know, between them, two and a half, three billion people, it, uh, it keeps going up and it's about to enter this exponential phase that I'm talking about. Both these, um, India and the continent of Africa 
have been in this linear path for a long time, but they're gonna enter this exponential phase that China had. And that's where I, I think a lot of people are missing the point of, um, of using demand from pre-COVID and just slapping it on into, um, into the um, post-COVID demand growth when, when that's really not the case. Um, okay, so when we take all that, we'll aggregate that into what's going on today. So, oh, there's a lot of people joining all of a sudden. Um, this is the latest data from Google Mobility, which tracks your cell phones. Um, for the people that don't think it does, it does. Uh, Google is tracking exactly where people are going. Um, and this is telling you the workplace usage worldwide by weighting of GDP. So GDP weighted. We had almost reached pre-pandemic levels in December. Then Omicron hit, and I'm talking about this big drop in, uh, in people traveling and going to work. And now we're back on this trend. Um, the latest data shows that we're almost back to the December highs and continue to keep going up. I can speak for Calgary directly. There's a bunch of um, offices that are now opening up. So this is going to keep going up and possibly exceed pre-pandemic levels. Um, despite all the people telling you that workplaces are dead and work from home is a new way to be, it's a very small segment of the population that, that really can afford to, um, to work like that. So on its way up, again, upside risk. That's what I'm talking about. The, the increased demand that's still coming, that's still there that we haven't got to yet. And we're already at pre-pandemic levels in petroleum demand worldwide, yet jet fuel legs, um, workplace, Workplace travel lags, a lot of the business travel is lagging. Um, we're at a slow demand season, and yet we're still at all time highs in gasoline, uh, in uh, overall oil demand. You know, where does that tell you? You skate where the puck is going, as they say. And all these graphs tell you we're going up in demand, not down. Um, this is retail and recreation. So I like to bring this chart up because it shows you that in December, we went above pre-pandemic levels on a global GDP weighted scale. And then again, Omicron hit, we went down again, and now we're on the sustained curve up again. And how far can this curve go? We don't know. That's where the whole pent up demand argument comes in, but um, looking good, a lot of demand yet to come. So to anyone talking about demand destruction, please, it's way too early to be talking about things like that already. We've seen no impact on $80 oil, $90 oil on global oil demand so far. So for us to start looking into the future and making all these uh, panicky statements, I think it's, um, it's a little misleading for sure. Um, okay, world demand growth, we keep going up. America keeps going up, the developed world. China keeps going up, India, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines. Bangladesh, um, you know, it's all up year over year. There, there's been no slowdown. Some of these countries have immense populations and very little oil consumption, and uh, it's not going to go down. It's, it's going up from here. Um, so there's a question here that will an increase in GDP from emerging markets offset demand destruction? Yes. So that's true, yeah. So one of the um, big things people fail to realize is that emerging markets are growing at more than one or 2%. They're growing at three to 4% per year. Um, so, you know, there's that. And then the talk about $5 gasoline or $6 gasoline, um, you still need about $125 oil, maybe higher to see $5 gasoline in the US um, on average. I would even say it's higher than that, maybe $140 oil. So it's a bit too early to start talking about that. Um, you know, and the federal government has already talking about taking off the excise tax of 18 cents a gallon. So if they do end up doing that, our, our consumption will, will continue to increase more. Um, 
world oil demand, again, it's up. Global oil demand by region. So you see that a lot of the emerging markets are where a lot of the demand is gonna come from. Um, Asia and Africa, um, the Middle East and North America also is, is growing demand by, by quite a bit. Um, and people you know, don't agree with that, but that's the reality of, of what's happening. Um, Asian oil demand by country, we see China, India, you know, Japan is, is kind of going down, South Korea is going up and Southeast Asia, you know, that's why I talk about jet fuel to the Philippines, to Malaysia, Singapore, et cetera, because it's a big growth engine in terms of Asian oil demand for uh, 2022, more than half a million barrels a day of demand is coming from, uh, from this area. Um, okay, this graph is, I think this, this slide explains what I'm trying to say. Um, very, very clearly. So when China hit this point in oil consumption, about 5 million barrels a day, they went from this linear growth to an exponential growth. Um, it, the, the slope definitely picked up even though they were at a higher level. And where is India today? They're at about 5 million barrels. And where is India's population today? It's about where China's population was when this exponential growth started happening. So if you extrapolate the same data, that's what's going to happen. You look at India's curve, this green line, it already had started to go into this exponential phase about you know, four to five to seven years ago. And then the COVID hit, which, which stopped the progress a bit, but continually going up. Um, Southeast Asia continually going up and Africa is, is a little bit behind, but you know, still, still using a lot of um, petroleum. And this graph on the right is, is just amazing. So people in America use refrigerators. One refrigerator uses 459 kilowatt hours of electricity uh, per year. And I'm sure you know many people in America who have more than one refrigerator. They got deep freezers, they got cold storage, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And there's six countries in Africa here which is about 400 million people, I believe, uh, when I did the math, who use less than the energy of an American refrigerator in a year. A lot of these people use less than a third of the energy of one refrigerator in a year. So what's going to happen as they start adding electricity, they start adding TVs, they start buying motorcycles, um, the per capita usage goes up substantially. You know, these are people who are using um, wood and uh, dung to heat their homes and whatnot. And, you know, once they go into any sort of energy usage of petroleum, the per capita usage just goes through the roof. Um, and, you know, this is a look into the future and what's coming. Um, okay. The Human Development Index. This is a graph that the BP puts out in collaboration with the UN. It shows the point I'm trying to make that there's this linear usage of gigajoules of energy. And once they hit a certain point, it becomes exponential because people go from, people go from no petroleum usage to some petroleum usage. They go from walking and using bicycles to having a motorcycle. They go from reading newspapers to having a TV. They go from cooking over fires to now having um, electric ovens and natural gas stoves and whatnot. So this is something to watch out for. It shows you the future demand is coming. And there's about five and a half billion people in this big rectangular box that are going to wanna be up here where, where America is, where Europe is. And if we dig deeper, Four and a half billion people out of this five and a half billion are on the cusp of this transition. So China, India, um, Bangladesh, I believe a lot of countries in Southeast Asia are in this block here, which are on the cusp. And this is why I keep saying, you have to put in the work of looking at each country's demand and what percentage it's growing at. You can't just take numbers from 2010 to 2019 and slap them on for this decade. 
because that's not what's going to happen. A lot of the big population centers are in this cusp of extreme increases in per capita energy usage. Um, so there's a question here on the Zoom about, does the local infrastructure support the electricity demand? Um, it may not at this point, but it's going to be. They kind of go hand in hand where, where you know, the, the demand is built out with the transmission and the infrastructure. We saw that in China with the Chinese electricity graph that I showed. You know, once, once the demand is there, they will come and they will build what you need whether it's uh, the, the, the uh, transmission line, whether it's the power stations, the infrastructure, it will all get built. Um, you know, and I can only speak for, for India because I've done a lot of work on looking at Indian demand and where it's going. I'm telling you that they, they are serious about providing electricity and, and providing a higher quality of life for their people, for their 1.4 billion people. So it's, um, it's gonna grow at a, at a rate that a lot of analysts are not forecasting. And again, um, that I think is one of the biggest reasons why people are, are saying there's going to be an oversupply all of a sudden in, in oil because they're, they're vastly underestimating the demand that's going to happen here. Um, world demand growth, uh, this chart shows the, de the demand at 2100, uh, way too far out, um, but you know, it just shows you that the energy per person is going to increase even from here. Um, this graph on the right, I really enjoy this graph. It's, it shows you that when the population of an area doubles, the number of households triple, the number of drivers go up by three and a half X, and the number of vehicles go up by more than six X, and total vehicle uh, miles traveled go up seven X. So this is showing America, what, what's happened to America in 70 years. This is going to happen to Southeast Asia and India and China in a span of 10 to 15 to 20 years. Because back in the 50s, vehicles were not so common. Now they're very common. So this, this 70 year trend that happened to America is going to take 15, 20 years in these emerging markets. And if the number of vehicles in these emerging markets goes up by six X, you know, I think, I think the math is pretty clear on, on what's gonna happen to, uh, to demand. Even if you have electric vehicles, even if you have compressed gas vehicles and blah, 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 if your number of vehicles goes up by six X, I'm willing to bet a majority of them are going to be internal combustion engine vehicles. It's not all gonna suddenly become electric in five years or 10 years. Um, There's a comment here that, that this growth will not happen based on um, a YouTube video. I don't know, I don't know what it's uh, showing, but um, I'll get back to you, Seppo, on that once I once I look at the video. But uh, you're you're really going against history, and you're you're arguing against what the data is showing. Um, a total of 240 LNG ships were ordered last year. There you go. Um, all cycles get accelerated and leapfrogged. Cable, wireless, 5G, internet, yeah, so I agree. Um, and I don't wanna get into an argument of people who think electric vehicles are gonna take over the world all of a sudden because um, I will get into that here later. So, so if that's what the, some of the chat is about, um, I'll show you why that's not gonna happen. Um, so global SUV sales, they were about 15, you know, 12 to 15% in 2010. They're about 45% today. So what happened? Well, people go in public and they talk about climate change and they, they're doing their, their best part to recycle and they're doing their best part to uh, save energy. And they went to LED light bulbs and then they traded in their little V4 engine for a V8, V8 Denali or a, or a V8 Mercedes, right? So the impact of one of those things is much bigger than the rest combined. and People are buying SUVs. They want more room. They're doing more road trips. They want space for their skis, their camping equipment. They're, uh, they're taking the kids to sports. And it's a snowball effect. If you're driving a little S, um, sedan and you see more and more trucks and SUVs and big crossovers on the road, what's your next purchase going to be? Probably an SUV or a truck. So 
this graph is very important. Um, it shows that this, you know, even in 2020 and 2021, um, with, with the collapse or the recession or, or whatever you want to call it, um, people still kept buying more and more share of SUVs. Um, so, you know, keep an eye out on what's exactly going on. Don't just see what the media tells you about EV sales are going to are going to take over the world and, and gasoline is going to be zero in five years. It's just not the case. When you look at the data, it's not the case. And it's all the forecasts have been mostly wrong or over exaggerated, which also I will talk about here um, a little bit later on. Um, how does mass transportation or affordability play into this? Um, I, I will throw this out there. If anyone has a graph that shows me that public transit usage has gone up since the pandemic, I really wanna see it because it's the, the exact opposite. People don't wanna use public transit anymore. They wanna have their own little car where they, they're not um, around other people who can carry disease or, or whatnot and they want their flexibility. So vehicle demand is going up. Uh, we see this in the used car sales market. Um, despite the shortage in semiconductors, we, we see an incredible increase in the price of used cars and increased suburbanization. In terms of affordability, I think things are just getting more affordable for the emerging markets as you go. We see this because the, the rate of change in vehicle sales is going up still. So until that trend changes, I'm not worried about affordability. Like, of course, not everyone in India or China or, um, you know, even America has a vehicle or is going to get a vehicle, but um, a, a significant portion are, and it's the growth rate that's important, not the absolute um, value of, of how many people can afford um, a vehicle. So global coal demand, we haven't even really hit peak coal yet, which was supposed to be phased out in 2010. And America and Canada and Europe has done a really good job with phasing out coal. And we still haven't hit peak coal demand. Um, so for anyone telling you that so-and-so is gonna stop selling um, gasoline vehicles by 2030, and so-and-so is gonna do this and that, and um, you know, there's gonna be no more oil usage. I think this graph tells you the story of, of virtue signaling and making predictions that you're not going to have to fulfill because by then your government's going to be out of power. So does it really matter what, what predictions you make um, just to appease the public? Norway, I love talking about this. Norwegian oil demand. People keep telling me that Norway is all electric vehicles and they're doing such a great job. Um, and they are. Last year, 92% of vehicles in Norway sold were either electric or hybrids, um, plug-in hybrid and non-plug hybrid included, but 87% was electric and plug-in hybrid combined. And what's happened to, Nor to Norway's oil production? It's barely gone down over the last 10 years, despite their electric vehicle sales going from like 2% to 87%, their oil demand is roughly the same. This, this dip in 2020 is because of COVID. If you ignore that, their oil demand went down by about 4% in 10 years, whereas the electric vehicle sales went from 2% to about uh, 87%. So again, the data does not agree with what people say that once electric vehicles are, are you know, make up 90% of your sales, all of a sudden your oil demand is gonna fall off a cliff. That's, it's just not how it works. And I can assure you, America is not going to be 90% electric vehicle sales in, in any time close to what people are predicting. Um, Norway has been able to do this because of huge subsidies on, on electric vehicles. They have a huge tax on gasoline vehicles. They have a huge fund, um, ironically, from their oil and gas sales that, that subsidizes some of these costs of, um, of electric vehicles. Um, so, very important graph that I think people should pay attention to. Um, all this nonsense that I hear about electric vehicles taking over gasoline and the scale at which it's gonna happen, and all of a sudden petroleum demand is gonna to fall to zero. Um, 
here's your example. Here is a prime example of a country that has converted to electric vehicles and nothing has changed in terms of oil demand. So um, again, data, data is your friend. Trend is your friend. The media and the politicians are not your friend. They just are paid to say whatever you know garbage that 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 people and the the uh, lobbyists are putting in their mouth. Look at the actual trends. Look at the actual data, and it does not support what people say. Um, so let's talk about New York has sixty electric vehicle buses uh, from five thousand and nine hundred. So there you go. Um, you know they they make a big media statement, but for one percent of their fleet. Um, Norway's electric vehicle sales are for a second car, so there you go. I made a I made a post on Twitter the other day that electric vehicles are basically toys for the rich. So if you need if you need a second car as an electric vehicle and you still have a gasoline vehicle, um, that's not really what a lot of people can do. the The average citizen um, can do so. But I digress. Um, demand in Peru. Why do I bring this up? So Peru is a country that people say, oh, whatever, you know, it's it's an emerging market. It's growing at one to 2% per year, which is what people factor in. Look at the data. It's grown at 4% per year. The oil demand is grown at 4% per year already. Um, and extrapolate this to some of the countries that are getting more modernized, like India, like Southeast Asia, a lot of, a lot of South America add up all their demand and add 4% on it, it's more than a million barrels a day, especially if America is growing at half a million to a million barrels this year, um, you know, and, and Canada's growing and, and Mexico's growing and the Middle East is growing. I think the demand number for 2022 and 23 is going to shock some people. And, you know, people are going to be caught off guard by, by some of the numbers coming out who, are, who keep using this 1% to 2% growth rate worldwide when um, you know some of the trends have changed some of the data is showing otherwise a little thing on natural gas albertan natural gas demand was the highest it's ever been in january us natural gas demand despite a warm winter is at all time highs um, so what is that telling you the storage again canadian storage is almost at a 5 year low and US storage is now hitting its five year low, even with a warm winter, you would say across North America. So if inventories are dropping and demand still keeps going up and supply is not really keeping up, you know, these three factors tell you the entire picture of, of what's happening and what's gonna happen um, in the future. Um, Okay, there's a comment here that the oil companies are shedding their upstream staffing because they can't find enough oil and the notion that demand will peak. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the data doesn't agree with them is all I can say with that. Um, world LNG demand, somebody mentioned the, the number of ships being ordered. Um, Asia is hungry for LNG. Europe is hungry for LNG. The Middle East wants LNG. Um, so it's just going up. Um, there's a question here that shows, can you talk about what's driving increased Albertan natural gas demand? Yeah. So one is intra Alberta demand has gone up by about a BCF a day within Alberta. So this is residential, this is commercial, this is electricity generation because of coal to gas switching. We have increased exports into the US so as the US is exporting about 13% of their supply now, they're wanting more and more gas from Alberta and, and British Columbia. We have the LNG Canada project is kind of like a on the horizon. So it's, it's a almost like a psychological demand increase. And we have demand going to Eastern Canada as well. That's increasing. We have the oil sands producers as they ramp up they require more and more natural gas. So just overall, it's just more and more demand within Alberta and for, for the eco gas, as they say. Is there any questions on the demand here before we move into the supply portion of the presentation? No. 
Okay. Um, yeah, feel free to, to say something on the chat or if you have uh, questions to, to um, um, interrupt me on the audio as well. Um, there's a comment here that I agree with comments that EVs are toys. My daughter got a Tesla three this year, but dad had to drive his ice to rescue her during the last storm. Yeah, I, I don't think I need to add much there. Um, okay, so we know the inventories are dropping. We know the demand is going up. Where is supply then? Can supply match the growing demand? Can it match the growing demand and the inventory supply demand deficit we have? You know, so here I'll I'll show you why not and why I'm uh, I'm more bullish on oil. U.S. This is the U.S. Rigs keep going up week over week. We've had a big increase in February so far. Um, production has done nothing. Production has in fact dropped from the December highs. It's going down. Um, so you're adding more rigs, yet production is going down. Um, we were at about a 700 rigs in pre-COVID and US production had flatlined. Um, and now it's dropping with about 400, 500 rigs going, let's say, but slowly inching up. And you know, this is over the last month, slowly inching up. Like I said, the rigs are, are slowly going up about 30 a month, about one a day, you can say. The, the big reason that we're still able to grow production in the US with a lower rig count is due to DUCs. So what are DUCs? They're drilled but uncompleted wells. So these are wells that were drilled in the past, but they weren't completed and brought onto production. So they, they were basically just sitting there as kind of like um, a savings account. And what producers have done is instead of spending money on drilling new wells and then completing them, they started completing these wells that were already drilled. That way they didn't have to pay for the rigs. They didn't have to pay for the steel uh, casing in the ground. They didn't have to pay for surface lease creation, you know, and, and all the costs that go along with it. So they've been taking advantage of this, um, which you can see here. We were building DUCs all the way from 2014 till pre-COVID and about 50% of them are now gone. In less than 18 months, they've used up 50% of these DUCs. Uh, sorry, this was all the regions. So, so the seven big regions in the US, this is just the oil plays. So we see the sustained drawdown, um, you know, in the Anadarko, the, the Permian is the main one we need to watch. That's a big growth engine that's been supporting world oil growth for the last five years, um, you know, getting pretty low on the DUCs. And out of the roughly 4,000 DUCs we have left, just a little bit less than 4,000 in the oil regions, 2,200 of them are dead, meaning that they're uneconomic. They never found oil. They uh, screwed up the drilling in some way that the well can't be produced. So out of 4,000, 2,200 are dead. Another roughly 700 to 1,000 are actively being worked on meaning that there's a drilling rig on site. So you can't just go and frack a well when, when there's a drilling rig on site, drilling more wells. So, you know, they, they can't really be accessed until the drilling rig is off site. So 2,200 are dead. Let's say 800 are being actively worked on. That's 3,000. And this graph, I don't know why it's showing 5,000. Um, I got to go back into this, but um, that leaves about a thousand DUCs which can be maybe brought onto production. Um, we don't know these 2019 and 2020 DUCs, are they all live or are some of them dead? But they're drawing down DUCs at roughly 200 a month. And there's about a thousand left, best case scenario. That gives you about five months more of runway, probably less because this graph is from January, 2022, um, you know, and, and a lot of, fracked slash completions are 30 days delayed already. So you're you're running on fumes here. Like you have maybe three months, best case scenario, you know, mid, middle case scenario, let's say that you have on DUC inventory left, at which point if you don't ramp up rigs, 
production in the US will not only stop growing, it will not only stabilize, it might actually start dropping. And you know, so far we see this from, from the highs of December, production is down about 200,000 barrels a day um, into, um, um, in, the, in the supply standpoint. Um, there's a comment here that my theory rests on the assumption that the world is running out of oil. Um, so I, you know, spoke too soon. I'll show you exactly why there's no more oil left here um, in, the, in the next few slides. So America has been a big growth engine, like I said, for the last five years. The Permian, the Permian and the Eagle Fur and the Bakken added about three to four million barrels a day in production between them over the last four or five years, soaking up the world oil demand. Um, and it's no longer the case. Not only can they not grow at this huge rate, they're running into this problem here when, where the DUCs are also running dry. And uh, you know we'll kind of keep a close eye on this and see what happens. Um, another point that I think is ignored, a lot of people look at US oil production for the last six to eight months and they say, well, shale has been able to add 500,000 barrels a day. Well, it's not shale, it's conventional wells. So the old school wells before the invention of hydraulic fracturing, we had producers drilling vertical wells, uh, making oil, the, the old historic wells. These are the ones that producers are ramping up and are responsible for 300,000 of the 500,000 increase in production. So shale itself has basically done nothing over the last nine months, eight to nine months. They've only added about 200,000 barrels a day, let's call it, with increasing rig counts and the DUC count absolutely falling off a cliff. So if America needs about 150 more rigs to stabilize the, the DUC count and shale is, um, hasn't really done anything even with the DUCs, what does that tell you going forward? C can shale really add a million barrels a day like people are projecting this year? You know, my, my bet, like I'm willing to bet anyone that it's the under on that, um, but I digress. My point was that it's conventional oil, not shale oil, that's majority responsible for the increase in US oil production over the last six to eight months. Um, a little bit more on DUCs. These are the big producers in the Permian, XTO, uh, slash Exxon Mobil, Chevron, Pioneer, and Diamondback. Look at their DUCs, they, they built them up and they're almost completely gone now. So the big four don't have much to go into the DUCs, they have to ramp up rigs if they wanna maintain the same kind of production, uh, new wells on production that they've been bringing on throughout 2021. This is further added by the fact that if you look at companies that have released their 2022 budgets, they're, they're budgeting for 20, 30, 40% more cost of capital for keeping production flat, right? Like that doesn't really make sense. So. The reason for that is that some of it is inflation and some is because they've now ran out of DUCs. So they have to naturally spend 20 to 30% more to bring a well onto production. Um, this is some excellent work done by Flow um, that, that really dives deep into the DUC count. They say there's only about two months of, of DUCs left. Um, so again, running on fumes, it's running, it's running pretty close to the edge here where unless we see a massive rise in the rig count, um, U.S. production is on is on thin ice here, um, as they say. So we we talk about capital discipline. A lot of producers in the U.S. don't care about production anymore. They care about free cash flow, and that's obvious here. The majors, the large caps, and the small to mid cap companies have barely added rigs, despite oil being above eighty dollars a barrel. Whereas it's the private companies that have jacked up production because they're looking for a sale. If they can increase their production big time and you know, maybe get one of the majors to bite and buy them out, they can get their private equity out and they can get cash for their, for their stock money. So it's the private companies that are ramping up these, these rig counts. And if you look at the slope of this graph, it's kind of already stabilized in October. And I can tell you for a fact that 
private rigs were down five month over month in January because these companies were not able to sell. They jacked up production, but nobody bit. And now they're kind of stuck with all this production that's still not making money and uh, bank debt to pay. They got an answer to their PE sh um, shareholders. Just not looking good for, for the people who have been adding rigs. That can be seen in the graph on the right here. Private equity, private equity was funding about one new company every three days in 2016 and 2017. They really brought on a lot of new companies, gave them a bunch of cash, and the companies proceeded to lose over $300 billion over the last five years in, uh, in cash. Their, their combined free cash flow was negative $300 billion. And that's why this happens. In 2020, Private equity was funding less than one um, new upstream focused oil and gas company per month. So they went from one every three days to, to less than one a month. Um, okay. Um, there's, there's a talk here on how would you rank the basin's capacity? So the Permian is the basin you wanna focus on. That's really the only one that can bring any significant, well, amounts of volume online. The Eagle Ford is kind of, could add a few barrels, but nothing crazy. And the Bakken would be happy staying flat. And if they can't, uh, can, can stem the declines a bit. Um, it's less the total supply, it says, than the financial, politi political, and time cost of bringing that supply into production, agreed. But if the supply is not there to begin with, then the, the other stuff is just additional headwinds on that. What are your thoughts on Scott Sheffield's recent comments about not raising CapEx up to $200 a barrel? Scott Sheffield used to get paid in, in terms of how much production he can jack up. Now he gets paid on how much free cash flow he can jack up. Hence why he makes these statements. He, he doesn't care what his production is. He cares how much money they make. And that's what a part of that is what goes into his own pocket. So, you know, keep an eye out on compensation structures in US oil and gas. It's moving to a cash flow slash free cash flow based metric rather than a production metric. And it's part of why you're seeing so much capital discipline in the shale industry. Permian basin flaring. So the whole flaring situation where you're just burning gas instead of making use of it is, is getting a lot of attention now. And you see a lot of the big public companies are doing a really good job. And I believe Scott Sheffield is the one who actually made a comment that the, that the private companies are just flaring too much and need to be ramped down. And he's absolutely right. The data agrees. There's, you know, the, these private companies that are in the lower end of the range. I mean, I've never even heard of these companies, Zervona, um, Venser, Secutor. It's the companies you've heard of um, that are flaring a whole bunch more than 3%, some even up to 10%, uh, Taprock operating, Colgate, which is a big Permian producer, almost $5 billion worth, Endeavor, Mewborn. These are the big Permian producers that are flaring a lot and there's going to be more restrictions placed on them. Um, you know, Texas is pretty wild west to begin with, but I think some of these have to get ramped down and there will be more pressure, which will further impact how many rigs these private equity guys are gonna um, start jamming up. Um, reserves, so there was talk about whether the supply is there. The US currently uses up about 10% of its reserves, produ produces about 10% of its reserves per year. Compare that to the Middle East, less than 2%, Canada, less than 1%, Venezuela, you know, point, 0.1%. A lot of the countries in the Middle East, you know, they have lots of reserves where they can keep this oil going for, for many years. Um, some of the data I don't fully agree with. It's it's manipulated and misled, but it doesn't change the fact that the, U the U.S. has only 10 years of production left at the rate that they're producing it at. Definitely not something you want to be um, counting on as being a stalwart of production going forward. 
if you're producing almost 10% of your reserves per year, you really don't have much left to, to grow production, um, you know, let alone keep things stable for, for four or five, six years. U.S. net imports. So people say, okay, well, the U.S. inventories are going down because they just keep exporting more and more products. Um, not the case. The U.S. became a net exporter in 2020, and now it's back to being a net importer. So a lot of the oil that the U.S. was exporting available for use across the world, they're now not only not exporting it, they're now importing oil that the world was using. So the supply and demand in America has gone the other way where they used to be able to export oil. Now they're importing oil on a, on a net import basis. Um, there's a comment here that Pioneer CEO stated last week that it's not shale, it's OPEC that will do it. So agreed. And uh, OPEC itself can't do it because this is OPEC plus crude exports so far. We see it's gone down in December and then it went further down in January. And the latest data from Vortexa tells me that uh, OPEC plus exports have not increased in February so far. So OPEC is talking about adding 400,000 barrels a day of production. A, they're missing on the production numbers. B, their internal consumption is going up by so much that they really aren't exporting anything extra. In fact, their exports are going down um, overall. And we see here that the big two that people rely on to add production, Saudi and UAE, are already exporting at pre-pandemic levels. So all this talk that these two will continue to, to add, add barrels, it may not be the case. It's the rest of OPEC. It's really sliding and they haven't been able to increase production. You know, with, right now, OPEC plus exports for January 2022 are lower than they were at the beginning of 2021. So in one year, which they've had to get their fields online, get the maintenance done, drill new wells, they have done nothing. They've done absolutely zero um, of that. Um, so there's a question here. Yeah. I'll speak about Venezuela here um, in a bit. So global supply, again, the reinvestment rate is just not there. Companies are hoarding cash, as they say, they're uh, making a bunch of money and they're not reinvesting it. And rightfully so, they've been slammed over the last few years for drilling wells and trying to build pipelines and whatnot. So, you know, they said, okay, well, we'll just return the cash to shareholders and pay off debt. and." Um, see what happens. Annual spending on oil and gas was about $900 billion in, in 2014. It's now less than half of that, and it's projected to stay at less than half of that all the way till 2025. Um, so again, the, the discipline is really showing in the projections and in the reality. Um, similar graph. CapEx was three times what it is today when the oil price is at today's um, numbers. So, you know, we haven't spent anywhere near what we needed and it's coming to bite now and it will come to bite as we go into the future. Um, you know, the when people say a lack of investment, it's pretty obvious when you look at this graph that there's been a lack of investment um, based on what's needed and it's gonna bite it. You know, if people are concerned about higher oil price and higher gas price today, it, there's a lot more pain coming. And, you know, as a consumer, maybe that's not what you wanna hear, but it's just the truth. Companies have not spent enough money to maintain production, to grow produc production, to explore for production. And um, it's almost too late. It's the cycle is not such that you can just jack up production all, all of a sudden takes time and um, that's what we're gonna see here. And, and that's why people talk about structural bull cycles is because um, it's gonna take some time for this to solve itself. Um, okay. 
So 60 to 70% of the world today, the oil production is conventional production, which is non-hydraulically fractured, non-oil sands production. Why is that important? Because conventional production was our easy oil, the oil that was easily accessible. You could drill holes and, and get these monster wells coming online. And it's what the world relied on from the 1900s all the way until about 20, 2005, let's say, is when the conventional oil really started to decline and lose its place. And conventional oil follows a Hubbard linearization, which means that when you produce more than half of the recoverable reserves, your production goes into terminal decline. It's a fact. That can be shown for every field. Every conventional field across the world follows this trend. And one could argue the unconventional fields are going to show a similar trend, but that's to be seen. So the example I'll use is US conventional production, which produced half its reserves. They were producing about 10 million barrels a day at the peak. And since then, it's just been a continued decline. They've been able to stem the production a bit given you can run water flooding schemes, you can run CO2 flooding schemes, EOR schemes, infill drilling, but you're still declining from the peak by a lot, by a big margin. You cannot keep producing at the peak. So let's extrapolate that to the biggest oil field in the world, Gowar. Gowar at its peak produced roughly five to 6% of the world's production just on its own. It's a field in Saudi Arabia, and when this model was put out, they had produced about half their recoverable reserves and production was starting to decline and projected to decline further. When Aramco put out their IPO in 2019, they said Gawar was at 3.8 million, down from 5 million. So if we just follow this graph to about 2019 and we take it up here, it's about 3.8, maybe a little bit lower. So they have been able to stem their decline a little bit. But look at this graph on the right. That's the red are the producing wells and the blue are the injection wells. Do you see too many places left where they can drill? This graph is 15 years old. So all the wells in the last 15 years aren't even shown here. And it's, it's in a terminal decline and it's declining further and further. The latest numbers that I was told was about 3.2 million barrels. So you take 2021, you bring it up here, you know, 2.9, 3.2 is kind of where we're at. Um, anyways, um, there's some questions here on the supply and where I see pricing going. So I'd like to answer those after I go through the entire supply because a lot of the questions get covered here as we go. So it's not just Gawar, it's every field in Saudi Arabia, which is roughly nine to 10 million barrels of production in the exact same terminal decline phase. All of them hit their peak in the 1970s and the 1980s, and they stayed flat as you see back here, uh, just like Gawar did for about 30 to 40 years, and now they're on the terminal decline phase. Um, Kuwait, same thing dropping about 10% sometimes year over year. And the latest numbers, they're below 2.5, um, you know, so continual declines on the supply side. So inventories are dropping, supply, demand is going up and supply, our, our pillar of supply, the Middle East reservoirs and American shale is, wobbling it's showing declines it's not really being able to even maintain production in in the middle east case um on the left here is the rig counts in saudi arabia way down um baker hughes is not 100 percent accurate but the the counts are still down than where they were from 2013 to 2019 opec plus rig counts are down 32 percent still from pre-covid so they haven't really been able to bring on the rigs that they wanted to. Um, Russia, one of the other big producers in the world, about 10 million barrels a day. We have 
them peaking about 2026, but they're really not adding that much production. They're adding about 100 to 200,000 barrels a day of production per year. That doesn't even stem the decline from Kuwait, let alone Saudi Arabia, Iraq, um, you know, shale not adding a million barrels a day. It's, it's a drop in the bucket. North Sea, which is where the Brent um, benchmark trades, it's on its way down, you know, terminal decline. Norway has been able to stem this a bit with the Johans Ferdup field, which brought on about 470,000 barrels a day of production. But look at the forecast dropping right off a cliff. Um, Norway, I, li I like talking about Norway because um, a lot of misinformation is spread about Norway. So Equinor is a big company. I talked about consumption in Norway hasn't really gone down. Let me talk about exploration and supply. So people say that the North Sea can bring on all these barrels if, if Equinor really wanted to uh, bring on more Johans for ups up. This is 2019 data, I believe, from Woodmac of the highest potential exploration plays in the North Sea within Norway, like the, the Norwegian portion of it. So they've got these wells that pre-drill could have been these big, big discoveries. Um, this biggest one, Shenzhou, has not been drilled yet. But the next six biggest ones you see here were all dry holes. They did not find petroleum in reservoirs that would Mac, which one would say is probably one of the best in terms of forecasting oil and gas exploration plays, you know, had as their biggest kind of discoveries to be, six out of eight of them were dry holes. They did not discover commercial quantities of petroleum. It's getting very, very hard to find conventional oil. It's not as easy as just, you know, going out and drilling wells and, and finding this oil. It, it's, you're looking for it in the fringes. You're looking for it in new fields where the probability of success is now getting lower and lower. So just keep that in mind. Anytime people tell you about offshore and that, you know, offshore Brazil or XYZ is just so easy to bring on if they had the money. I'm telling you, Equinor is one of the richest companies with the most government backing and they're unable to find oil as easily as they could have uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, I, I looked up all these names and the news releases are there that they could not find oil in these wells. A um, little bit more on Norway. We see the same kind of pattern on oil production. We hit the peak for about five to 10 years. The green is the oil, by the way. And continual declines, terminal declines, at, at which point, once you're at about 50%, of your oil production from the peak, you can stem the declines a bit, but you're still 50% off your peak and you're never gonna get back to your peak, um, which is a big, big uh, drop in supply. Mexico, another one with the exact same graph, you know, used to be a big producer producing about 4% of the world supply down to less than 2% in 15 years. Their, their big Cantrell field kind of blew up on them, um, you know, declining hard. And Mexico has said that by 2023, they're not even gonna be exporting any oil because their own consumption is going up and their own supply is going down, meaning they have none left to export. Um, Cantrell field again, you know, had this big peak and big decline. Um, anyone who wants to talk about any other countries, it's the exact same graph. Indonesia, Egypt, Malaysia, Argentina, Colombia, Ecuador, UK, Australia, they all show the same graph. They all follow the same trend. Um, and, you know, that's fact. Th this is all um, fact. Brazil, okay, so now let's talk about the, the, where the supply can come from. We have Brazil, Brazil offshore was one of the biggest factors. People talk about these pre-salt reservoirs can, can add on production and they can, but not to the extent that people say it can. Brazil has constantly missed its production targets for the last 
seven to 10 years. Um, and on the right here is drilling rigs in Brazil. They had this big spike in investment. And then the world found out, oh, hang on. These wells are actually not as good as the government told us or as the uh, private companies told us. So we're gonna ramp down our investment and the investment to date has not come back. There was a very nice news release that came out about a week ago that Exxon Mobil was finding it hard to find oil in Brazil. They, they were unable to really get good success at finding oil. So you know, Brazil will add some barrels, but not to the extent of adding what they claim they can you know, add a million barrels over the next four to five years. It's, it's a little optimistic. Um, West African crude oil supply down. This is mainly due to Nigeria and Angola not meeting their production targets. So Rystad put out this uh, forecast in January of 2020 and West Africa is already missing that target by 600,000 barrels a day. So in less than two years, about they're missing the target by about 15% already. And that is forecasted to continue missing the target. It's not like it's a one year blip where something happened and they couldn't meet it. It's a sustained issue um, that has popped up here. And more supply that the world thought they had in January of 2020, that they don't. There's a 650,000 barrel a day deficit all of a sudden that's popped up. So again, for anyone that's looking at supply and demand, you know, and you, and you think shale can add all these barrels and whatnot, um, the rest of the world is just collapsing in terms of oil supply. Um, so we'll talk about American supply a little bit more. The 2021 wells are not producing what the 2020 wells did. And the 2020 wells are not producing what the 2019 wells did. And the 2019 wells are not producing, it goes all the way until 2016. America drilled their best wells in 2016. This is from shaleprofile.com. It's got every horizontal well drilled in their database. And the productivity of these wells is declining. Contrary to what you hear in the media, contrary to what the public producers will tell you, contrary to some of these amazing corporate presentations um, that people put out, the reality and the data shows you that well productivity is going down every single year, despite additions in technology and, and whatnot, um, productivity is declining. This is the Permian here on the right. So of every barrel of production that was online on January 1st of 2020, about 60% of that production is no more. So in just two years, less than two years, these wells, all the legacy production has declined by 60%. So when people talk about the shale treadmill and you can't get out of a treadmill, this, is, this picture is a description of that. That, yeah, you can add production a whole bunch, but now you have to spend so much money on sustaining this production that you're almost in a treadmill. You're in a cycle where it's very hard to add production. And we see that throughout 2021, um, shale hasn't really added that much production, which goes to my previous point on that it's actually conventional production that's brought on a lot of barrels. And even that's getting maxed out now. So we'll see how this goes going forward. Um, on the left here again is, is a Permian specifically. The 2021 wells are on a bad curve. They're on a massive decline that we didn't see in the 2020 curves. And the decline is happening earlier and earlier every year we go. So the more the wells decline, the more new production you need to bring online just to keep your production flat, right? So if you have to bring on more wells just to keep production flat, it's harder and harder for you to grow. That's just the reality, that's the science, that's the physics, math, and engineering that people keep making memes about on Twitter. You know, that's what they're talking about. You can talk whatever you want, but the physics, math, and engineering will tell you what's actually going to happen. Um, water production, the Permian wells are producing less oil and more water. The water oil ratios are as high as four, four to one right off the bat. That means that 
for every barrel of oil that these wells produce, they produce four barrels of water that needs to be recycled, cleaned up, and disposed of. Another huge headache and cost on these producers, and the water oil ratio keeps going up, right? That's the big thing. As they keep going up, the costs add up, your well become less and less economic, and it just kind of is a, is a snowball effect from there. Um, American supply, there's only a few companies that have good acreage in America. They, all of them will tell you they have top decile production. All of them will tell you they have top decile uh, reserves and acreage. How can all of them have top decile uh, stuff, right? Well, who is in the bottom 90% then? And the fact is they're all lying to you straight to your face. And it's pretty obvious here. This is in the Eagleford. Conoco has by far the best acreage. Um, Marathon, which is a JV with Baytex, has the second best, you know, really good wells. Then you have EOG, who talks about their double premium inventory, and they have 15,000 locations, um, you know, and then everyone else is stupid, and, and they're the ones who really know what's going on. Well, how come their wells don't pan out? They're about 30% below what the Conical Phillips wells are. Murphy, and then you have Callan and Chesapeake, which is pretty trash acreage. Um, you know, less than half as productive as, as conical. Um, you know, and it's important to, to keep these things in mind when you're investing in these companies. Like, they don't care. They will cherry pick data to make it seem like um, they have good acreage, good wells. We saw a big um, news release come out about Apache and the controversy over them lying about their Alpine High. The CEO got paid this huge $60 million bonus, I believe it was, because of straight lies and fake data. So, you know, dive a little bit deeper into some of these companies and you will find shale is really, maybe not on its deathbed, but it's definitely not close, anywhere close to what people are claiming it's gonna add over the next two to three to four years. Um, they're in trouble here, especially once you have this big production number and a high decline, it takes a lot just to stem these uh, these declines, let alone grow production. Well permitting has not increased. We're not back to 2019 levels. So again, permitting is still down. It's a precursor to rigs. When the rig count will ramp up, the permits should ramp up about a month or two before that. And the data so far does not support a big ramp up, especially in the Bakken um, and the Eagleford, the Permian as well, to some extent. Um, Water disposal, another problem in the Permian. They're disposing about 15 million barrels of water a day. And it's not easy to dispose of this water. You know, you can only recycle so much. The rest has to be pumped deep into these formations or you pump them into shallow formations. But then when you drill new wells, now you have to drill through these pressured up shallow formations. So producers rather um, inject this water deep into the deeper formations, and that causes earthquakes. Um, correlation is not causation, but in this case, I think anyone who tells you that these earthquakes are not because of um, deep groundwater disposal is maybe has some other agendas. Um, you see all these earthquakes centered around Mentoni, uh, Pecos, and Midland, which is where the big water disposal hubs are. Um, you know, big earthquakes, more than three magnitude. We see here, this is the cumulative number of earthquakes. Um, you know, if not for increased oil field activity, what's the reasoning for it suddenly going right into the stratosphere, um, you know, in terms of the earthquakes that are happening? More than three magnitude. Um, and yeah, there were no quakes before the drilling. No. So now, um, Contrary to popular belief, the earthquakes are not due to fracking. They're due to groundwater or disposal in these, in these zones. Produced water disposal in the zones is what pressures up the zone and causes these earthquakes. Um, but they, they go one in, one in the other. If you're fracking, you're producing produced water, which then has to be disposed because there's nowhere near the recycling capacity required. Texas seismic events by year. 
I mean, the, the data speaks for itself. You can't argue what's happened here. It, it's gone up 7x in four years. The number of magnitude um, 2 plus earthquakes. We're even having magnitude 3.5 plus earthquakes now, which is when the regulator kind of stepped in and shut down some of these disposal wells or lowered their rates. This is your Bakken. And I think it's pretty obvious why I say they're going to have a lot of trouble increasing production, let alone keeping production flat. There's just nowhere left to drill in the core. You have, you know, they've even drilled into these under these rivers and lakes and whatnot to get the oil. And uh, not much left here, not much room left to uh, plop on a pad, uh, you know, and this is the core, I should say. There is Bakken fringe, which is what this graph on the right tells you. Of the about 40,000 wells left to drill in the Bakken, only 700 are top, court, uh, top quintile, top 20%. And of the about 40,000 wells left in the Bakken, only about 6,000 are in the top 60% of sites left. The rest are bottom 40% sites, which, yeah, they might be economic at $140 oil, but, you know, it's, uh, it's not really something you want to rely on to show. Um, and the other point I want to make here is, again, about well, well numbers. You'll see companies like Continental say, oh, we have this many years of, of inventory left in the Bakken. What they don't tell you is, is it's all the garbage. Uh, bottom half of inventory, right? Like, let alone top quartile, it's not even middle quartile, it's it's more towards the bottom end of, of the um, economics. Um, there's a question here that will Canada have similar issues with, with earthquakes? Um, I don't believe so because they use a lot of their water, reuse it for fracking. They don't have as much disposal going on you know, not even close to the 15 million barrels a day that the Permian is 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 uh, disposing. So it could be a problem in the future, but not even a tenth to the same extent. Um, it's not the volume of water that really matters. It's it's the volume plus the rate. So when you're injecting 15 million barrels a day, you know, every single day, that's what causes the earthquakes. It causes huge pressure buildups in these zones and then the plates move. Um, I'm not an expert on, on earthquakes and how that works, but um, the, data, the data shows that there's more earthquakes happening at a higher frequency and at a higher magnitude. So that's fact. Um, how many shelves are there to produce in the Bakken? I don't really know, but I don't think it's, it, it's as many as the Permian has, uh, which has a few. Um, I think the Bakken is, is um, yeah, I, I don't want to make a statement that's wrong. So I, I honestly don't know, but um, that's why I show this graph on the right that the, even the shelves that are left are, are not your, your productive um, economic shelves. Gas oil ratios. So we have a problem with water oil ratios. The Bakken also has a problem with gas oil ratios. So, um, you know, we had about 2,000 cubic feet per barrel being produced. Um, you know, a, a year or two down the road in 2015. Then we hit three and four. And the 2020 wells, less than a year in, their gas oil ratio is more than three. So when you have a reservoir that's losing its productive capacity, it loses its pressure, and a lot of gas comes out of the oil, your gas oil ratio goes up. It's a sign of a mature and dying reservoir and the data supports it. The Bakken has gone from 15% weighting of its total production being gas to now 30% in less than eight years or uh, nine years, I should say. So things have, um, you know, things are gassing out, things are watering out. It's more headache because now you gotta get rid of this gas. You can't just throw it in the tank and um, um, you, know, you have to do something with it. Um, Okay, there's a question here on if shale break even is, is $30. Um, anyone who, who says the shale break even, break even is $30 and is willing to lock that in at today's price, 
and, and give me the rest as a profit. Um, I'll give you the money today. Um, if you can, if you can give me any well that actually produces at $30, including acreage costs and drilling and, and uh, decline mitigation and everything else, um, we can make a deal here. Um, your take on the offshore drilling, I will bring up offshore here in a bit. So uh, I'll talk about some of the reservoirs that are coming up in, in offshore. Two very important points about shale and America that are often ignored and I think play a big part in what's happening. Number one, just because your reservoir extends out to all these acreage, doesn't mean that the acreage is productive. You could have wells. This is a DJ basin, which was uh, kind of very popular earlier on. They've discovered where the economic extent of the reservoir is. The rest is uneconomic. It, it, it's maybe not economic to 150, 200, $300 a barrel. Just because there's oil there, and you see this fancy maps with people saying, oh yeah, we got 600 sections and you know, blah, blah, blah. It could be all junk. It needs to be within the productive area for it to be actually recoverable reserve. So keep that in mind. You'll see these maps now more and more pop up with private companies who are looking for funding. They'll throw this fancy map about the reservoir extent on there and fail to show you that the, the rock in this area is, is just trash. Um, so, you know, something to keep in mind. Uh, the first thing. The second thing to keep in mind, as producers drill longer and longer laterals, we see talk about Chevron drilling three mile laterals, uh, laterals in the Permian now. Are the well economics better? Yes. Each single well will end up paying out faster and will produce more oil than it used to if it was a smaller lateral, a shorter lateral. However, the longer lateral you produce, the less oil you eventually get from your acreage. And that can be seen here with, with EOG, their one and a half mile lateral, about two years down the road, had recovered about 40 barrels per foot. The two mile lateral is at 30, uh, 35 um, barrels per foot. So this affects your reserves. When, when someone tells you we have so much reserve in the ground, the longer lateral they drill, the less of that they're getting out. So the more and more longer wells you get, the less inventory there is left and the less oil, recoverable oil you have left. So don't fall for this where, where people tell you they have longer laterals so they can recover more oil. Yes, it's per well more oil, but for their entire acreage, they're gonna, they're gonna recover much less oil. So, you know, maybe it's not a problem today, but one, two, three, four years down the road, this is going to come and bite you. And no one is expecting the consequences of this. And you see the gap getting wider and wider as the well gets more and more um, runtime. So, you know, things that I think are important in shale, especially, shale has gotten this reputation for being a 30, 40, 50 year reserve. and um, there's some, there's some reckoning coming here and then some people are gonna look real stupid here, um, just like Apache just did with their, uh, with their uh, lawsuit that came out. And um, you know, it's gonna be quite embarrassing with, uh, with some of the data that's gonna come out about the reality versus what these companies were projecting and telling investors. Um, another problem, this is a company, this is a private company in Canada and Every private company did this last year. What they did was they saw the oil price going up in February, March, April. And a lot of the private companies looked for an exit. They said, hey, we can get, we can jack up our production with these monster wells. And then, and then one of these public companies will be stupid enough to fall for it and, and buy us out, which worked really well for many, many years until 2021. So they weren't able to sell. So five months down the road, six months down the road, we're into November of last year now, 
now these wells are declining even harder. So they have this huge initial production for the first four to five months, and then they fall right off a cliff because the wells were structured this way. They were overproduced to make them look good for sale. Every private company in Canada, um, I shouldn't say it's a fact, this is my opinion. Most of the private companies in Canada and the US did this. So what you have now is these massive decline rates propping up um, and why maybe shale has shale production has fallen off since, since December because some of these wells have, have had this bubble point death as they call it and big declines um, kind of showing up. And uh, there's, a, there's a comment here saying it's a bait and switch. Yeah, I think for, for anyone who's, uh, who's really paying attention, I think this is, I mean, the data is pretty obvious. You can see this and I, I commend this producer because they're, they're currently on the block for sale and they have the, the um, confidence to put a graph like this in their corporate presentation, you know? So uh, they're, they're at least being truthful with what's happened here. And I think any, anyone who's been involved in private equity, um, any engineer slash reservoir person can kind of see what's happened here. Um, you know, and um, I think uh, there's a comment here on on what I say, but um, you know, I it's it's the truth. I think it's it's the reality of what's happened. A lot of people are scared of, of making these claims and assumptions. It's not assumptions; it's, it's inferences based on the data. And uh, I like to tell you what I see based on the data. It's not fact. It's my opinion, my best understanding of the data and uh, why I think it matters for investment going forward. It's, uh, there's headwinds coming here, which the market is not seeing. It's not put into their calculations. A lot of people are just being lazy. And um, you know, that's why like today's macro, I mean, we're, we're almost more than two hours already. And I, I thank everyone who's been patiently um, on this and, and focused and paying attention. Uh, it really means a lot, but I really think it's important to get through these points because once you understand these things, you know, I, I sit there with, with a, some of my investments on margin, I'm playing options, and I sleep well at night. It doesn't bother me that the oil price fell four bucks this week. It, it really doesn't because uh, the reckoning and the, and the reality that's going to slap people in the face here is just too obvious and it's just being ignored, um, you know, by the entire investment community uh, outside of us, us people, I guess, we're who, um, who, who spend a little bit more time um, on these things. Um, okay, so I'll try and get through the rest here. Um, Guyana is a big frontier in adding oil production. They're adding roughly 100 to 200,000 barrels a day. So it is a growth, but again, drop in the bucket compared to what I showed you of the declines we're having, some of the shale not being able to meet its commitments, the demand increase, we have a 2 million barrel a day supply demand issue. You know, Guyana is adding 200,000 barrels a year. Yeah, it's, it's significant, but nothing crazy um, on a world supply demand outlook. Um, I like posting this chart in there because it shows you how hard oil has become to find. Companies are going into countries now that are taking up to 78% of the government take, as in the profits are going to these governments. So. You know, Guyana, which is the biggest frontier, 60% of the profits after, after a bunch of subsidies and, and um, uh, re, not reinvestments, but a, a bunch of tax relief and whatnot, they, they take 60% of the profits. Brazil is 63%, Suriname is 66%. So the fact that big companies like Exxon are going into these areas should tell you that Oil is getting very hard to find. It's, it's, they're willing to take on these really bad deals because it's really the only place where they can um, increase production in. Um, so I guess I'll go, go to questions here. Um, what is the risk in your thesis? So I will, I will get to it here. Um, and I love these questions, so uh, keep them coming. Um, so this is Guyana. I'll talk about Venezuela here as well. Um, Iran. So the two big issues standing on top of everything I've talked about so far, 
Iran and Venezuela. So let's talk about Iran. Their max production was about 3,800 barrels a day um, in recent history in early 2018. Their internal, internal consumption is about 1.6 to 2 million barrels a day. There was a recent article put out that the government had to ask people, beg people to stop using natural gas because consumption had gone so out of hand of natural gas. So what does that tell you about oil consumption, right? Oil consumption is also growing, yet people keep using these old consumption numbers from three or four or five years ago. So let's say internal consumption is somewhere between this. I can verify, I can't share the exact data because it's, it's through for Texa and OilX, which are both uh, paid services. I can guarantee you that 1.1 million barrels is, was getting ex exported in December and January. That is just crude. Another 200,000 barrels a day plus of condensate was getting exported through ship to ship transfers in the Singapore area, through loading a ship and then uh, unloading into smaller ships, through calling it Iraq Basra blend or you know some other blend when it's really Iranian oil, through turning off their transmitters, through sending it through pipeline into Iraq and selling it as Iraqi oil. It doesn't matter. The, the point is this much oil was getting exported. So you take 1.1 and you add it to the midpoint of my internal consumption estimate, you get 2.9. Um, 300,000 was from inventories. So it's not true production. So you take 1.1 plus 1.8 and you subtract what they pulled from inventories. Iraq is already, or Iran is already producing about 2.5 million barrels a day plus. So how much can really come online? Just over a million barrels a day, let's say. Um, I would think that there's about 200,000 to 500,000 barrels a day of exports that Vortexa and OilX are not able to track. This is stuff that's going underground. It's going, they're, they're fueling up vehicles and putting it on tankers that, that Vortexa only tracks ships, so they're unable to really get a good bead on this. So you add in another three to 400,000 of barrels, that's going to China, it's going to Russia, it's going to Iraq. How much is really left? Maybe just over half a million barrels a day. How much of that can come online in quick succession? Not much, because they're already selling a bunch of this oil illegally to China, who's, who's willing to pay so why would Iran not jack up production already? It's obvious that America is doing nothing about these things. So half a million barrels a day to 750,000 barrels a day in the next three to 12 month period. Does that really affect the market that I've been talking about here for the last two hours? It, does it make a considerable dent in it? You know, a, a slight dent, yes, but nothing really to shift the supply demand issue that were happening. Um, so Iran will make an impact, but it's not gonna shift the main issue that's occurring. You know, Maybe a 10 to 15% change in that. We talk about Iran inventory. There's 30 ships sitting here with 2 million barrels of oil each that people keep saying, oh, if the sanctions come off, all of this is gonna flood the market and, and kill your oil price. Well, okay. Number one, it's 60 million barrels. That's about half a day of worldwide consumption. Secondly, it's gas condensate, it's not oil. Gas condensate can only be converted to gasoline and some very, very light oils, and it can be used as diluent. That's it. Which countries are wanting this? Venezuela and South Korea. There's only two markets for this product. So it's not suddenly gonna flood the market. It's not gonna be a huge dent that's gonna drop oil price to 40 bucks. None of that sort. Um, so again, be careful of people who manipulate data and tell you stuff that when you compare it in reality actually makes no impact um, or, or very little impact. Um, and thank you to Tanker Trackers for this uh, picture. Very good, good work on, on tracking these because um, 
all of these have their transmitters off. So if you look for these ships on any ship tracking website, you will not find them uh, unless you use this night vision satellite data, which uh, I'm a big fan of uh, this kind of stuff. Venezuelan production. The recent max was about 2,700. 2, They're roughly at 700 today. So that leaves 2 million barrels a day that can come online. Okay. If Venezuela really gets sanction relief and they get their economy back online, there's about 600,000 of that 2 million that's going to go into internal consumption. Internal consumption has dropped from 834 to 241 in the last seven years. If the country really rebounds, that consumption is gonna come back. So there's, there's 2 million left of production, 600,000 of that is gonna be eaten away by internal um, consumption. So there's 1.4 million barrels left. What's the timeline for that? Well, Venezuela's state-owned oil firm had their debt rise to 35 billion in 2021. And they're focusing on good fields and robbing parts from other fields. They're, they have literally cannibalized these other fields where they're breaking apart pipes and engines and stealing everything they can to run the fields that are actually running. So the 1.4 million barrels that can come online, it's gonna take two, three, five, seven years, a lot of money, a lot of risk by these firms who have to put the money in just to see Venezuela uh, take over these assets or some other civil war breaking out, et cetera. So, yeah, it's a big number, 1.4 million. It can shift the supply demand dynamic by quite a bit. But, you know, people telling you it's going to happen overnight are once again, straight up lying to you. It's, it's going to take at least a year, if not three to five years, um, you know, to, to redo everything in the country and uh, make sure nobody's stealing this stuff, make sure everything is running properly. Um, they need a bunch of condensate from Iran to make it work. So if Iran gets sanction relief, they're no longer going to ship condensate to Venezuela under the table. So now we, you, there's another problem. You know, they, they don't even have the uh, condensate to blend with their oil to ship it. And Venezuela's refineries are in such bad shape that some of their tankers that they sent out have gotten returned because there's up to 3% water in there. There's a bunch of sulfur and H2S uh, content. So this is not the oil that they're, you know, America is going to suddenly, suddenly start importing. It's not oil that Europe is suddenly going to start using because it's not good oil. It's, it's not this high spec quality oil that these refineries need. So, you know, there's my answer to Iran and Venezuela. You might have short term drops because the market over analyzes or under analyzes these situations. They, they think it's suddenly going to start today. And that to me is the buying opportunity when people overhype these things, which in reality are, are not the case. So I got some pushback on worldwide supply that there's other countries I'm ignoring, you know, that you only talk about the big ones in the news, but you're ignoring some of these. So I thought I'll bring some of these in. Colombia, Azerbaijan, Indonesia, India, and Egypt. Combined roughly three to 4 million barrels a day. Um, I, I don't think I need to say much other than the graph. It's down and to the right. They're all declining in production. They haven't put the money in that's required uh, to keep production even flat, let alone grow this production. So, you know, I, I keep highlighting this point. Conventional oil is gone. It's very hard to find oil now. It's not as easy as just turning on the tap as a lot of people and the general public thinks. You just drill a random hole and you open up the, the pipeline and this oil starts flowing. It's, it's no longer the case. And, you know, here's another three to four million barrels a day of production that suffers from this issue. Gabon, a small producer, same thing. Equatorial Guinea, same thing. It's gone in 15 years, it's dropped by more than 60% their production. Nigeria, same problem. You know, there's a lot of reserves in Nigeria, yes. Can they boost production? Yes. Have they boosted production? No. They're down over a million barrels a day in 15 years. So 
you know, there, there's more to it than just reserves. I mean, where the supply is there, there's political problems, there's environmental issues, there's theft and uh, kidnappings and, you know, whatnot. So it's not easy. Algeria, same thing, you know, and between these countries that I just talked about and Mexico and uh, OPEC, um, Russia, Guyana, the Canada, US, you know, that's almost the entire worlds of production that, that I've referenced here. Um, you know, all, all the major producers. Okay, are there any questions uh, before I go into kind of the closing of the macro and uh, move into that and then we can take a break here. I know it's been a long slog. So once again, I appreciate everyone who's, uh, who's been actively tuning in. Okay, cool. Um, so banks and analysts, what are they saying? Morgan Stanley is saying $100. I think they recently upped it to 125. Um, RBC is Michael Tran, which is kind of a guy who understands macro. This is a person who, I think he's on Twitter as well. You need to follow Michael Tran. Like he really understands what, what I've said here over the last two and a half hours. This is the guy who I, I really kind of molded my kind of macro outlook on what he says in his uh, 30 to 40 minute seminars. Um, you know, the structural multi-year bull market. That's the point I'm trying to make. This is not a volatile market where suddenly tomorrow the oil price is gonna drop to $60 and stay there. If it drops, it's gonna go back up because it's a structurally, uh, strong cycle it's a it's a structural problem it's not a short-term issue here um bank of america is saying 120 dollars a barrel with the booming air travel so um you know as i mentioned the the global um flight demand that's why i focus on that a lot um asian demand coming back global gas crisis goldman sachs is at 100 dollars. i think they they also said 125 um recently we have, um, you know, we, we're very early in the cycle yet. People are talking about selling everything already. We, we're very, very early in this cycle. It has a long ways up to go. It has a lot of time to go. These things don't just happen overnight. And the cycles have been compressed, but, but a 10-year cycle doesn't suddenly become a two-year cycle. So, you know, from my investment standpoint, there's a long ways up to go. Um, the free cash flow. Companies are putting out more free cash flow today than they were in 2014 because they're not reinvesting as much. Their operating costs are going down, um, have gone down. Their GNA costs have gone down. Their interest costs have gone down. So, you know, they're already putting out significantly more free cash flow than they did in the 120 oil period of, um, of 2014. The and the equities are not reflecting that. They're still sitting at somewhere between 50 to $64 oil in terms of the multiples that they used to get. Are we gonna to return to those multiples? Maybe not, but we shouldn't be $25, $30 a barrel of a discount on the, um, on the multiple either. Um, yeah, and then energy's market cap punches way below its earnings potential. It's by far the lowest um, as a value of share price to its um, index, forward index earnings consensus. So long ways up to go to catch up to some of these tech names and um, real estate, consumer discretionary, et cetera. Um, yeah, okay. There's some comments here, which I'll get to. Um, here's the upside potential. So the XLE and the WTI have moved relatively similar in the past. And today we sit here with, with the oil price strip being at $85 and this big gap. And this is the gap that until this gap normalizes, I see no reason to sell. And it's part of the reason why you see the equities behaving very strongly, even when the oil price drops a little bit, the equities don't really drop. Um, oil and gas has done exceptionally well in the year to date, about up about uh, 79%. Clean energy ETF globally is down 25%. So, um, you know, keep an eye out on where the money flows are going. Where, where's the money leaving? 
and where's the money going into? It's, uh, it's important because some of these investors in the clean energy funds used to be the investors in the oil and gas funds, and now they might be rotating back in a way. Um, oil versus GDP. So demand destruction doesn't happen till consumption is about 5% of GDP. And because GDP has gone up a lot, we currently are only about two, just over 2% of, of world GDP being oil, oil consumption cost. So we still have a long ways to go um, before oil, oil uh, consumption hits such a high cost to the, to the GDP. Um, this is a slide I'm very, very proud of as a person who's worked in oil and gas and um, as an investor. The number of people not in extreme poverty has gone up significantly along with the percentage of people not in extreme poverty. And it's, you know, you can say it's, it's due to any kind of technology, but energy has been the major contributor to this with oil and gas being the major contributor to, to, to energy. So, um, you know, be proud of what you do. This, this is not something that we're polluting the environment and we're throwing uh, oil into the ocean and whatnot. Um, you know, oil and gas has been responsible for the growth in the quality of life, in the growth in our society, in the growth in, in, in people's ability to, to travel and own homes and move freely across the world. Um, you know, oil and gas is a big part of that. So don't be afraid of, of, of you know, telling people that and, and sharing this. And a lot of people don't, don't understand logic, so it's hard to discuss things with them, but, um, you know, for me, this graph is kind of shows why I do what I do and why I really try to, um, you know, I'm, I'm so passionate for this industry and kind of what we do um, until there's a realistic substitute, which is not the case. Um, so let's talk about renewables for about a few minutes here. Solar panel prices have plateaued and are rising, unlike what people tell you that they have constant uh, price decreases, the high efficiency pa uh, panels have plateaued and are increasing. That's a fact. Um, lithium ion is about a hundred times less energy dense as gasoline and diesel. We have never gone in, in history from a lower energy density um, product to supply us to a, um, we have never gone from a higher density product to a lower density product in the history of mankind. And now you, you're telling me that we're gonna go 100X down and suddenly these lithium ion batteries are gonna take over the world. Um, yeah, we gotta be uh, careful here. Um, which policies would encourage you to buy an EV? This was a, a uh, survey done in Canada. So tax deductions, uh, free stuff, um, incentives and cheaper insurance, uh, more free stuff and uh, more free stuff. Like that's what is, in, is incentivizing people to buy EVs is because right now they don't pay road tax. They don't pay, you know, they get cheap charging some places. They get free parking some places. They get these subsidies and deductions. Um, what happens when all this ends? There's, uh, there's gonna be some change here. Um, this graph, which another one that I absolutely love, um, we don't have enough copper to meet the EV projections, electric vehicle projections by 2024. We don't have enough lithium by 2024 and we don't have enough cobalt by 2023, you know, late 2023. So, and the gap is not a little bit, it's magnitudes of gap. Of the entire world's lithium production, we need about three times that by 2030 to meet their uh, projections. So. Again, I think there's gonna be a lot of people with very embarrassing stuff that they've put out. Uh, they're gonna have, you know, egg on their face uh, because they're not looking at the actual actuality of what's happening. And, you know, lithium and cobalt are not just stuff you can just start up and, and, and start mining. A lot of the mines are long lead. They're in geopolitically problematic areas um, that there's a lot of issues with. So will be interesting to, uh, to watch this going forward. Um, 
this one I shared on Twitter, the, even with the most optimistic electric vehicle sales forecasts, which I just showed you why we're not gonna meet them, um, conventional light duty vehicles of the gasoline and diesel variants don't peak till 2038. So, you know, there you go. For anyone talking about oil demand is gonna go down in gasoline, um, your own predictions by these electric vehicle people is saying it's not gonna happen until 2038. So, you know, just because you stop, you stop selling 100% of your, of your vehicles being internal consumption, even if it's 80 to 90%, that's still adding to the number of uh, gasoline vehicles on the road. Uh, China lithium carbonate, again, same thing as solar panels, the lithium prices keep going up. So electric vehicles, if you thought they were already expensive, yeah, you better watch out what's gonna happen and what's gonna happen when the subsidies then uh, are removed. Yeah, it's gonna become a, not only a toy for the rich, it's gonna become a toy for the ultra rich. Um, renewables are not green. The minerals used in offshore wind and onshore wind are about 10 times than what it takes for natural gas and about five times what it takes for coal. So do we have these minerals? Do we have this zinc and rare earths and manganese and, and, and cobalt? Um, people haven't put the work in. They just throw out random projections without looking at the actual supply demand of these uh, minerals. You know, they, they don't just pop out of thin air. Um, same with electric vehicles. They use about four times the number of minerals um, per electric car than a conventional car. So, you know, one has to do the work. You can't just take a graph of what the sales have been for the last three years and and then and, and jack it up to some you know random number that you came up with without looking at how we get there. This is not this is not the metaverse. We're we're not there yet. I am in in there you can pop out any mineral you want out of thin air. It, it, it's not the case in in, re, in the real world. Um, there's a lot of talk about Canada's windfall tax coming up. Um, there's been some happenings in the last few days that, that may give more credibility to that. But the reality is it's been energy that's sustained Canada's merchandise trade balance over the last you know, 15, 20 years. It's everything else is dropping. It's energy that's helping maintain Canada's trade balance in a positive. So will the government shoot their golden, uh, golden hen that's been laying the eggs? You know, potentially they could, but um, I think it would be very stupid of them to, to do that and uh, cause further supply issues because if there's a windfall tax, companies are gonna be less likely to invest and bring, bring uh, more supply online, which is required in the future. Um, um, energy shortage again, the shortage is across the industry, fossil fuels, renewables, electricity, and energy efficiency. It's not just fossil fuels where the, we're not spending enough money. It's the electricity network, it's the transmission network, the renewables, energy efficiency, everything. Um, and the world is gonna have pay with, with more expensive energy here going forward. Um, Another point that got brought up to me was the manipulation that, you know, you talk about all these things, but you know, it's it, it's actually the financial markets that um, control the oil price, thank you. Um, and, you know, that could be true for gold and silver, which have been manipulated for a long, long time. Um, the oil market is at today's pricing about five times bigger than every metal in the world combined. So can you manipulate the market? Yeah. Uh, how long can you do it for? You know, fundamentals will take over because there's real money being spent. About four trillion dollars a year is spent on buying oil and oil products. So, you know, you can't just create oil out of thin air. And if the supply demand and the inventory situation is as it is, how long can you um, manipulate the markets for? Maybe a day or two or a week or a month. But you know, reality is going to be so severe. Um, when it finally comes to fruition, and, and it is. You know, the, the oil prices continue to go up despite all the jawboning and, and um, 
trying to talk down the price of oil, it, it hasn't mattered. Um, I'll skip this graph. Um, and I'll just end it with this. I think I've been, I've been uh, a lot of us in the energy trade have been smashing the table on this, on this sector for a while now. And uh, I've got lots of people who tell me that, you know, energy is dead and just buy AMC and buy Facebook and buy, uh, buy Peloton and, and Kathy Wood stuff. And um, when I say reality is starting to bite, I think uh, this graph tells you why. Year to date, energy is up 23% and uh, tech is down 12 and a half and then some even worse than that. So the, the difference between the two is, is about a 30, 35% difference in just year to date performance between energy and, and tech. And um, I think the, the rotation will continue and people will come to where the money is, where the dividends are, where the real growth is, not, not in some of the other uh, sectors. So I, uh, you know, I, I still keep uh, you know, sharing these macros because I, I think nothing has changed. Since I started doing these in, in October, November, the inventory situation has not changed. The supply has not changed and demand has exceeded even my own expectations in a way. So, you know, until that that changes, I'm uh, I'm I'm long and strong, as they say, um, in in oil and gas. So I'll I'll stop there. I'll go through some of these questions here quick. Um, um, you know, for people are saying that the Russia Ukraine risk, yeah, it's it's maybe a couple dollars in the in the price of oil. I don't think it's anything major um, because it really doesn't matter. We don't need geopolitical risk to, to, to bring up the price of oil. Um, uh, there's, a, there's something here saying that, I, that they heard the same arguments in 2008, um, what is different? So nothing is different, it's the exact same. When, when 2008 happened, the oil price went from 40 to $80 within a year, and it was above $100 within two years, and it stayed there. It proceeded to stay there within five years. So how can you make the case that 2008 was wrong? It was, it was correct. What changed that was a technological step change with unconventional hydraulically, hydraulically fra fractured horizontal production, which no one could have guessed that that was coming. So, you know, 2008 was right. And 2021, in my opinion, is also going to be right unless you see some sort of technological step change such as uh, fusion technology or you know some magical way to invent oil out of thin air um, but and I'm keeping my eye out this time I'm not going to get caught like I did in in 2013 um, you know keeping an eye out on on what's uh, what's going going through um, so there's this talk about can you talk about the effect of capex from green green investments? Um, so green investments don't matter. Like five percent of of oil worldwide is used for electricity consumption, and how much of that are you really going to convert into green energy? Right? Are people in in India and and, and Africa and China do they want to pay three times because their power comes from solar as opposed to coal? I don't think so. Um, so, you know, of that five million, how how much can you really convert? Maybe one in 20, 30, 40 years. And the EVs, I mean, I just showed you why EVs are not gonna be the next big thing. Um, if nothing has changed, why does it take two hours to cover it? Um, because in my opinion, and uh, tooting my own horn, I think this is the only macro outlook you need. I think if if you listen to this for for three hours, you're, uh, you know, I'm I'm very happy sleeping at night. I have no issues with with, with what's going on. Um, you know, the the shorter ones that I had, uh, I just got the same questions that I would have covered anyway. So, I think it's uh, it's getting longer and longer, but I think it covers more of the questions that are coming up. And the way I adjust these is all the questions I get in the next month, I go and research them and I pop them in this presentation. Um, you know, that way we're really covering all our bases. Um, what do you think the oil price will be next year? Um, I have no idea. I, I would be, you know, a fool to guess. Um, 
anyone talking about recession, I, I want you to show me any data that shows we're going towards the recession, not the stock market dropping, but an actual recession that's gonna lower oil demand. Um, I just don't see it yet. And again, it's, it's way too early to talk about demand destruction. Demand hasn't even stabilized yet or, or plateaued. It's continuing to grow. And we're already worried about demand destruction. It's um, quite early yet. Uh, how long do you see this bull cycle going for? Um, until supply comes online. Demand is not gonna stop. It's, it's supply that needs to make up for it. And there's only two sources of supply in the world that, that are easily accessible. Um, the Canadian oil sands and Venezuela. And when you see these two start to add significant barrels of production, that's when the oil price will go down. That's when the cycle will end unless there is some sort of other catastrophic event um, or a global meltdown. Um, nothing, will, nothing can stop it because fundamentally we're just in this cycle now. Um, there's, a, there's one at the beginning here. Um, did you say in India they will build 35,000 kilometers? Yeah, so they built 13,000 kilometers last year, which was about 37 kilometers a day. The highway and transportation minister wants to get to 100 kilometers a day of highway construction. And they're putting in the money in their budget that will allow them to do it. It's not just talk, it's, it's actually money being put in towards this. So, um, you know, 100 kilometers a day times 365 days, 36,500 kilometers um, a year. Um, Arctic oil, I don't think the Arctic can add, add any major production um, in America. Um, in Russia, maybe, I think they're already producing a lot of oil from the Arctic under the table. So I think you're right, it's hypocrisy. And what are you gonna, what are you really gonna do about it? But, um, you know, it's, it's not meaningful enough. And I think um, it's just too far out. And um, um, I guess we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, offshore drilling. Um, I don't know which other offshore drilling you're, you're talking about. Uh, maybe the Gulf of Mexico. So the Gulf is adding about 300,000 barrels this year because of projects that were sanctioned earlier. Um, how much more can they add? My opinion is that they, they could add 100, 200, 300,000 barrels, but that's not gonna come online until 2023, 2024. And then you're just fighting declines all over again. And, you know, is the appetite there for so much offshore drilling? I don't really think so um, in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's not gonna go back to, to anywhere near what's needed. Can political change cause shockwaves? Yeah, again, I come back to the same point. Politics and saying something and the EV trend and whatnot, can it cause the oil price to drop? Yeah. But we're in a fundamental issue here, you know, where I could, I could be talking to you two months from today and the supply demand uh, imbalance could be as much as 4 million barrels a day. We've never seen those kinds of imbalances ever. We've never seen supply so hard to bring online. We've never seen demand go through the roof like it has. So it doesn't matter because if inventories keep dropping, that will make, make a much bigger impact on oil, on oil price than uh, anything you can keep saying. And we saw that the Biden administration started talking about SPR release and they're gonna do uh, ban US exports and blah, blah, blah. And what happened two months later, the price was even higher than what they, what they were talking about. And now nobody believes it. Now they're, now they're the boy who cried wolf. So they've lost that uh, bullet in their chamber. Um, at what price do you expect significant CapEx increases? Um, I honestly don't think it's coming. In, in the public space, you would need 140, you know, 125, $140 sustained pricing for somebody to be interested in the oil, oil sands again. And the delays in the Trans Mountain project that we saw yesterday or the day before, that's gonna take the appetite out even more. So the governments are doing absolutely everything they can to make energy expensive for you and I. And until that changes, uh, you, can't, you can't catch up on CapEx. It, it, it's gonna take three to five years just to catch up on CapEx, let alone bring some sort of huge field into production um, all of a sudden. 
Um, big picture on global oil security. security. Um, I don't want to speak too much about this, but I will say that Libya is one to watch for. I think they've been online for the last couple of months, but there, there's a lot of issues there that are not easily resolved. Um, the, the government is in the West, but the oil production comes from the East. It's something like that. There's, much, there's a bunch of rebel militias and whatnot. So that's what I would, I would watch for and watch Iran and Israel. We have never had a drone attack on the UAE ever. And the fact that we've seen three launches by the Houthi rebels, one of which destroyed two tanks and killed three people right by the Abu Dhabi airport, which is a pretty safe, you know, uh, high-end airport, you can say, um, is it's getting, it's getting hot. And geo, geopolitical risk increases when the price of oil goes higher. There's usually more tension. There's more money to be had. So, you know, just, just keep an eye out for that. There's, uh, there's, there's definitely stuff happening that can definitely impact the, uh, the oil price. Um, I don't want to speak too much else ge geopolitics because uh, it's not really the, it's not the point that I want to try to make here. My, my macro is on the fundamentals and the, the geopolitics is kind of like its own thing, which um, makes short-term impacts, but doesn't really change anything. Um, in the short term, is the oil trade overextended? So I don't think it's overextended, but I think the Iran and Venezuela news can have an impact, a short term impact, and you could, you, you could buy the dip. Um, I'm watching inventories. If inventories, like with the step change we've had, the inflection point in jet fuel demand and the opening up of Europe and America, there's risk either way. You could have the news come out that, that Iran is online, drop oil price five bucks or 10 bucks, but I don't think the equities really drop. And the risk is to the upside in that the inventory shortfall could get very, very severe here. You know, if, if jet fuel adds, let's say half a million barrels in the next couple of months and US gasoline picks up half a million barrels in the next month, couple of months, I mean, your supply demand could go totally out of whack. And, uh, pressure the inventories and thus pressure the price higher. So I'm not gonna try to time the market. I'm gonna stay in and whatever happens, happens. I know that six months down the road, the risk reward is heavily tilted in my favor. And uh, that's how I, I, uh, I invest. I don't look at the next week or the next month. It's, uh, it's more long-term. So we've been going for about three hours here. It's, uh, it's really, gone quite long here this macro session so what we'll do maybe we'll let's take a 20 minute break let's come back at uh, 15 minutes past the hour and um, we'll get started on the valuation sessions so we'll be doing white cap Pado, and spartan delta i will try and keep it tidy and get through all three in an hour hour and a bit as opposed to the usual detailed um, stuff that i do because you can go back to my previous videos and look at the detailed um, calculations that I'm doing in, in there, a few more of the explanations. Um, but yeah, let's do that. Let's come back at uh, 15 past the hour and, uh, and get started, yeah. Uh, I was just gonna mention, Shubham, uh, mm -hmm. if, if I may just may suggest if, if uh, for the 20 minutes of the folks that are on here wanna discuss, maybe folks like uh, 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 Seppo Corpella, if he wants to, uh, I know he's, he's, he's authored some materials on uh, in regards to the, uh, the uh, discussion you've had, if he wants to share a couple of insights or and get a conversation going. And then for the people that want to take a break and take the break, uh, just a suggestion, uh, Shabbat. Yeah, yeah, no, you betcha. I'll, I'll close my video. I'll close my audio and then I'll, uh, I'll come back in about 20 minutes and I'll leave the, I'll leave everything open here for whoever wants to talk, uh, whether it's here or on Twitter spaces. So um, yeah, I'll leave it open. You bet. That sounds good, thank you. 
Hey, Sean, just to unmute yourself, uh, Seppo, just unmute yourself. You just press the button, the unmute button. <laughs> 